Billy Holiday, I sing your blues. Bet your life against me, and I swear to God you lose it. Motherfuck the cops, we still saying for St. Louis. Motherfuck the cops, we still saying for St. Louis. Motherfuck the cops, we still saying for St. Louis. Later in the hour, we'll talk about the ways the medical community is still learning about the effects of menopause, especially for black women whose symptoms often go untreated. But first, there's a nearly 32 acre plot of land in North St. Louis County that has been through significant transformation in recent years. The historic black burial grounds of Greenwood Cemetery went from being a place of disrepair, impassable by foot or car, to a beautiful, peaceful space with visible, accessible headstones, a variety of native plants, and a new permeable pavement road in the works. Greenwood's renewal is due in large part to a married couple who grew up in the area, who felt called to restore the cemetery over the past decade. And they're here with us today to talk about it and to celebrate the cemetery's 150th anniversary. Shelly Morris is secretary and historian for the Greenwood Cemetery Preservation Association. Shelly, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. And Raphael Morris is the association's president. Thanks for coming in, Raphael. Thank you for having me. And I should add, you know, you both wear a lot of hats when it comes to Greenwood Cemetery. Not only do you do admin work, you know, including building connections with nonprofits and businesses, mm -hmm. but you're also part of the ground crew. In fact, you made up the original ground crew. You know, at one point it was just the two of you working out there with a push mower and some shears. So really kudos to you, you know, getting to visit the cemetery earlier this week. It looks really, really beautiful. Well, thank, well, thank you. Thank you. So, Raphael, when we met earlier this week, you told me that you decided to retire in order to restore Greenwood Cemetery. What led you to the realization that you wanted to make this your life's work? Well, I don't know about my life's work. <laughs> but, or for uh, the rest of your, <laughs> your retirement's work, <laughs> your post-retirement work. Because you left your, you retired in order to do this, is that right? I did. I, I, I don't want to say it was a calling on my part. But it very well may have been. I never would have envisioned 10 years ago doing what I'm doing now. But there's nothing I'd rather be doing than what I am doing right now as far as in the restoration of Greenwood Cemetery. I guess it was a little over nine years ago uh, while watching the news one morning. Uh, Shelley and I were watching the watching the news and this, there was a cat, there's a story about the cemetery in the North St. Louis that was in disrepair. And I remember uh, telling Shelley, I said, when I was a kid, about eight or nine years of age, I remember my father stopping in front of a cemetery over on St. Louis Avenue, and he told me that I had family in that cemetery. And of course, I went over my head at that age, but as I was watching this newscast that morning, I told Shelley, I bet you that's the same cemetery my dad was talking about, you know, Lord knows how many years ago. So they were trying to uh, form a group that following weekend to see if anybody was interested in trying to uh, do something about the conditions of the cemetery. So I got there that morning, saw just how how overgrown the cemetery was, and I felt that this is where I needed to be. And what did you see? Oh my, it was absolutely nothing but a forest. You could not see one single tombstone on the property. So you almost wouldn't know it was a cemetery. I had people all the time tell me, I didn't know this was a cemetery. The growth was easily 15 to 20 feet tall and so thick you just couldn't even think about trying to look through it to see where you were going. It was just really horrific. Wow. So um, I said, okay, this is uh, probably something I probably need to get involved with. So uh, I told Shelly that, you know, I think I'm going to go ahead and retire and devote my time to trying to do something about this situation. She co-signed my decision <laughs> and um, followed me some months later. And um, here we are nine plus years later, still fighting the good fight. Cemetery is almost 32 acres. We probably have cleared 27, 28 of them, and um, we've got so much going on right now, there's not enough hours in the day to keep up with everything we're trying to do. 
So when he decided to retire, I wasn't quite ready, but I knew that we needed to do something really significant. And so that's when we decided to, in order to really make a, an impact, we needed to form an organization. So February of 2016, we formed the Greenwood Cemetery Preservation Association. It's a 501c3. And with that, we're able to really uh, connect with other organizations. We're able to uh, apply for grants. You know, so like Raphael was saying, who knew we, we would be doing this 10 years ago? So things that we didn't know how to do, we're learning. 150 years of black St. Louis history is included mm. in these nearly 32 acres at Greenwood Cemetery. It was founded in 1874. Yes. More than 50,000 people are buried there. Are you, you know, as you started hacking away at the overgrowth, pulling up headstones, what stood out most to you? What surprised you? Well, one thing I found was that the cemetery was a lot larger than I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize the cemetery was shaped like a T, and all I could see was the long portion of the T. And uh, when I committed to do this, that's all I thought there was. But little did I know the uh, offshoots went 1,500 feet in one direction and 1,000 feet in the other direction. And um, I guess I had a brief few seconds of trying to decide had I made a good commitment or a sound <laughs> commitment or not. But um, you just never know what you're going to find between just the everyday task of trying to uh, restore order to the grounds to who may have come by in the night and dumped a couple of households worth of uh, stuff, you know, in the cemetery that you've now got to deal with. So uh, it's, it's a challenge on a daily basis. Greenwood is on the National Register of Historic mm -hmm. Places and the National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. Yes. Shelley, you know, as the historian with the association, tell us about some of the notable people who are buried oh, there. Gosh, we have a lot of people. One of our uh, most prolific is Harriet Scott, the wife of Dred Scott. Uh, she was a freedom suit petitioner who ultimately lost her case before the Supreme Court in 1857. She and her daughters are buried there. Charlton Tandy, who was a civil rights activist in the late 1800s who helped the exodusters. Uh, he was also very big in the Underground Railroad. Lucy Ann Delaney, she was a freedom suit petitioner, and she was also a Masonic founder. Arsania Williams, who was involved with the YWCA, she was the first black president of the chapter here in St. Louis at the Phyllis Wheatley Center. Uh, we have so many other people, uh, people that were involved in the Civil War. The, the, we have Buffalo soldiers that are buried there, World War One and Two, uh, veterans. So we get to tell a lot of stories of, of folks that uh, that have that started their life here in St. Louis. It's been wonderful. And those chimes we heard at the beginning of this uh, conversation, those are actually at Harriet Scott's tombstone, I believe. So if you're looking for yes, her stone, yes. just follow the chimes. Just follow the chimes. What does it mean to you to have this history here so close to home? And would you encourage even people who don't have personal connections to Greenwood Cemetery to come out and to see some of what's there? I would definitely encourage people to come out and, and listen to the stories of various people that are there. It is such a peaceful place to walk around and, and just reflect. Uh, you can just learn so much about the struggles of people that are interred there. So many of the people that, that are buried there, the way they live their lives, their struggles, will tell you what was going on in St. Louis at the time. You know, the, uh, the segregation, the working conditions, the living conditions of people. So many people die from tuberculosis or some type of lung ailment. So did they live close to where they were? Or were they breathing in those same fumes? You know, how old was that child when that child died? What were the causes? And then you see that there are a number of children that died around the same time. What was going on? So when you start to visit the cemetery 
and you're in a particular area, you start to notice that what's going on here. You know, these are a lot of young people that died around the same time. You have to go back and research it. You know, so it, it, it's really an interesting place. When it comes to family members, though, the stories that I hear from them are they used to, when they would drive by because there was no entry into the cemetery, they would just stop and blow a kiss in the direction of their loved one. That was the closest that they could get. Now we're getting those calls uh, because they heard that what we're doing and they wanted to know, is my mom's area been cleared? And I'm able to tell them yes. I'm able to meet them uh, and take them to where their their loved one is buried. You both have family buried at Greenwood Cemetery. Raphael, I believe you have, among others, an uncle, a grandfather, a great-grandfather buried there. Have you been able to connect with your relatives, with your ancestors, in a different way in finding their graves and learning more about them in the last several years? Well, I just vaguely knew that I had family in that cemetery. And um, one day I was cleaning out the family home. Both my parents had passed. And I ran across a Bible. And in the Bible there were a, a small stack of funeral burial cards. And looking through those cards, that's how I found out that I had great-grandparents and grandparents and all sorts of aunts and uncles who were buried in that cemetery. Mm -hmm. I have found um, three relatives so far, my great-grandmother, my grandfather, and an uncle. But I still have uh, two sets of greats that I haven't found yet, mm -hmm. and uh, countless uncles and aunts are, that are still on, on site there that I haven't located yet. So uh, it's constant motivation for me. And Shelley, your grandmother, great aunt, and some cousins mm -hmm. are buried at Greenwood. What, were you able to find all of their their graves, and what was that like? Mm. No. I was able to locate my grandmother, which I contacted all my family members to let, let them know that I had found her headstone. But there are still many that I'm not able to find, and I'm not sure where those records are. But I, I'm not going to give up hope on that. Has working at Greenwood, digging into this history, has it changed your mindset about certain things, be it, you know, the roles of cemeteries themselves, your own family history, or even broader St. Louis history? For me, I recognize just how important it is for people. I know that some people feel like, well, my mom is gone, and that's that's all I care about. I don't need to go see where she's buried. But there are so many people that it does matter to. And it's it's just something. When you see two sisters finally come to visit their mother who had died when they were children, and now they're in their 70s, and we show them where their mother is laid to rest, we realize that they never had closure. And now we've given them that. And it, that's just one story out of hundreds. So I know that what we do is important. We're talking with Raphael and Shelley Morris of the Greenwood Cemetery Preservation Association, the historic cemetery. In fact, St. Louis's first non-sectarian burial grounds for black people is celebrating its 150th anniversary. That's the ones who are lost and displaced and whose houses were knocked off its foundations by winds and tidal waves. Cemeteries turned into mazes, caskets coming out of their graves like they was in Texas and they was sitting sideways, days for days from sin. Skeletal remains remain scattered and unclaimed, that's a shame. Bush said he accepted the blame, so tell me, why they playing games with the money trying to give us the change? Our neighborhoods are being reconfigured to be rearranged. Everything is strange, I know you can because I know I've been changed. The angels in heaven done Sign my name, I proclaim and Jesus done led me through the fire, the storm, the hurricane and the rain Broke off the chains, loosened up the hands, then kicked in the frame You don't even have to remember my name The official death toll from Hurricane Milton may not be telling the whole story New research suggests that lasting damage from storms like Milton Could result in thousands of additional deaths in future years Particularly among the most vulnerable in society 
Sarah Kaplan is a Washington Post climate and science reporter. So, Sarah, this study says that additional deaths could be caused by hurricanes 15 years beyond. How does this happen? These researchers um, based in California did an analysis of death tolls in states that have been affected by hurricanes for the last 100 years. They looked at 500 tropical cyclones, and what they found is this consistent pattern of every time a hurricane hit a state, the death rates in that state were higher than they were before the hurricane. This is a kind of statistical analysis that is often used to sort of identify initial signals that there is something dangerous happening in public health. So it's the same methodology that, for example, researchers initially used to realize that smoking was linked with health problems. What they find is that after a hurricane hits, a state might see between 7,000 and 11,000 deaths for as long as 15 years afterward. And it's because of the disruption that the hurricane causes to the health system, to the economy, to people's social networks, and to their mental health. Did it find that there were groups of people who were particularly badly affected by this? I was talking with one uh, first responder who said a rule of thumb in disasters is that the person who is most vulnerable after a storm is the same as the person who is most vulnerable before a storm. So all of the things, the inequalities that we know exist in our society definitely play out and get exacerbated by a hurricane. They found that about half of the excess deaths were among elderly people, people over the age of 65. The most disproportionate impact of hurricanes was actually on infants under the age of one. So even babies that weren't born before the storm hit were more likely to die unexpectedly after the storm. Those babies are, might be born into families that have more stress, that have less financial resources, less ability to access both prenatal care and postnatal care, less ability to buy food or formula for their kid. And so they're more likely to see the kinds of um, illnesses that can lead to infant mortality. One of the other really striking findings was that there was a pretty big racial disparity in how this effect played out. So the researchers found that indirect deaths among black Americans was three times higher than among white Americans who experienced the same storm. And that really suggests to them that the unequal access to health care, to emergency response and support that uh, we know exists in this country is really playing out uh, during a hurricane as well. You say that the researchers ruled out other factors, uh, and some people may hear this and think, well, it's because of climate change. These storms have become more intense. But their research goes way back. Yeah, so they went all the way back to 1930, and they found that these excess indirect deaths actually occur after every storm, um, both the ones that have happened 100 years ago and the ones that are happening now. They do find an indication that the number of excess deaths is increasing, but the primary reason why that is is actually because the number of people living in these dangerous hurricane-prone areas has increased. So Florida, for example, which was hit hard by both Hurricanes Helene and Milton, is one of the fastest-growing states. And so, you know, if you have more people, that's more people who are in harm's way. What does this suggest about the way our country responds to uh, natural disasters like this? So the researchers that I spoke to said that this really highlights a need for more interventions and more um, social and, and physical support after a hurricane happens. These deaths are not happening because someone got caught up in floodwaters or a tree fell on a house. They're happening because people are not able to access the kind of care, the social safety net that they might have had before a hurricane occurred. Or maybe that social safety net never existed, and then without that bit of extra stability that, has, that it gets taken away by the hurricane, people start to fall through the cracks. So the researchers told me that they think this really highlights the need for you know, more community health programs going out and making sure that people who might have mobility issues are able to get to the doctor's appointments that they need. They said it shows the need for more support for families to ensure that their kids are getting the food and medical care that they need, that people are getting the mental health treatment they need. And right now, a lot of the emergency response systems that we have go away just a few months after a storm occurs. So people might be able to access food assistance or help, like free mental health care through FEMA for a few months. But what this research suggests is that the trauma lasts much longer and that people are going to need that support for much longer.
Very sobering research. Sarah Kaplan of The Washington Post, thank you very much. Thank you. A terrible thing to waste. Environmental racism and its assault on the American mind. Written by Harriet A. Washington. A recent fire at a biolab facility in suburban Atlanta is raising questions about why one of the chemicals stored in the facility isn't more regulated. The blaze caused a chlorine smell. 17,000 people near the facility had to be evacuated, and more than 70,000 others were in lockdown for several days. Marissa Mecki with member station WABE in Atlanta has been following the story, and she's with us now to tell us more about it. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks Marissa, for having. Thanks for coming. Do we know yet how the fire on the roof of the building got started? Um, it's still not exactly clear. What we do know is that water got into the facility that's storing the chemical, TCCA, which is used to make like pool and spa products. But it's highly reactive and it catches on fire when it comes into contact with water. What we don't know is whether this water had seeped in from Hurricane Helene or a sprinkler system malfunction because there was a small fire on the roof that firefighters had previously extinguished that morning, or if it was some combination of both. So I understand that people smelled it all over Atlanta and the EPA and local officials tested the air around the metro area and that they found the chemical levels were supposedly unlikely to cause harm to quote unquote most people, which I can imagine was kind of worrying. But has the company said anything about all this? The company Biolab and its parent company, Kick Consumer Products, haven't said all that much. They have offered publicly to reimburse residents for hotel rooms while they were displaced. Uh, their community liaison, Dexter Porter, did show up for a press conference last week. And here's what he had to say. I would like to say we're sorry this event happened into the community. And we're doing everything possibly to make sure that the community is safe. And this isn't the first incident that the chemical company Biolab has had. You know, they've had a big one in 2020 in Louisiana, similar to what happened in Georgia. And the facility here in Georgia had three incidents in the last several years, plus a motion violation. So this isn't their first, you know, rodeo with the, talking to the public about their incidents. Tell us a bit more about the chemical itself and how it's regulated. So a group of Georgia lawmakers is trying to up the regulation of this chemical with the EPA. You know, it has a lot of regulations already at the state and at the federal level, but they're hoping to put it on the EPA's risk management program. And this would require the facility to have more thorough plans to prevent chemical accidents like what happened here in Georgia and a better emergency response plan. Um, this case in Georgia, it took several hours to alert nearby residents of the accident and the different messages Atlantans were getting from different agencies caused a lot of confusion on the ground. And people just want companies like Biolab to be more prepared and for the EPA to communicate more effectively. So are there any lawsuits connected to this? Yeah, so we're still seeing a bunch of those kind of start coming through. There's already a couple class action lawsuits in the work. Um, some of those are suing on the behalf of the residents' health, you know, kind of environmental health impacts, and others are suing for businesses that had to close during the fire and, you know, had losses. And the state is still investigating the incident, so there could still be room for permit violations and for fines associated with that. That is Marissa Mecki with WABE in Atlanta. Marissa, thank you. Thank you. I'm getting in the elevator, and these two high school white boys tried to get on with me, and I just dove off. I said, y'all ain't killing me. <laughs> I am scared of young white boys. If you white and under 21, I am running for the hill. What the hell is wrong with these white kids shooting up the school? Each faces dozens of charges as prosecutors say they try the father-son duo separately. Fox News' Eric Perry joins us uh, from outside the Barrow County Courthouse. Eric, a lot of new details coming out of this case tonight. Yeah, Courtney, Tom, we actually saw two and a half hours worth of witnesses and testimony before that grand jury. We talked with the district attorney there. 55 charges for Colt Gray, 29 for his father, Colin Gray there. This is probably the biggest case Barrow County has ever seen, and especially a case with this many witnesses and victims. 
everyone in America will look at what is happening, look at the facts when they come out, especially at trial, and realize the things that we can do individual level to stop this violence from happening. That's Barrow County District Attorney Brad Smith moments after a grand jury handed down a laundry list of indictments for both Colt Gray and his father, Colin Gray. Colt is the alleged gunman in the September mass shooting at Appalachia High School. He faces 55 counts. Four counts of murder, four counts of felony murder, four counts of aggravated battery, 25 counts of aggravated assault, 18 counts of cruelty to children in the first degree. Colt's father, Colin Gray, faces 29 charges ranging from second degree murder, second degree cruelty to children, involuntary manslaughter, and reckless conduct. As Smith says, he saw the warning signs but took no action. In fact, went a step further in buying Colt a gun for Christmas. Smith says there is a total of 25 victims, two teachers, two students killed. The 21 others were either physically injured or emotionally. For the 14 victims who were not physically injured, 13 were inside a classroom that Colt Gray went into and fired indiscriminately in that classroom. One was in a hallway that Colt Gray pointed the firearm at but was not struck. As this will undoubtedly be the biggest case Barrow County has seen, it also shines a light on parents who could be held legally responsible for their child's actions. We hope this can start the process of healing for the community. Um, the charged victims we have are the ones that the crime was actually directed towards, but every, vic every person, every kid in that school was a victim. Yeah, he went on to say those people in those nearby schools locked down were victims. The parents were victims, also this community victims as well. Giving you a little bit more color inside of that grand jury hearing, we saw from two GBI agents. We also saw from a detective with the Barrow County Sheriff's Office and an advocate for victims with the district attorney's office. We are expected to see Colt and Colin Gray for their arraignments. We know that date, November 21st. That's the latest outside the Barrow County Courthouse. Samir Perry. Fox 5 uh, you can imagine uh, those families are happy to see this case moving forward. Eric, thanks. That's when I realized my one true calling in life. And what's that, Mickey? Shit, man. I'm a natural born killer. New information came during a hearing for Colt Gray's father, Colin, in front of a Barrow County judge this morning. Let's get out to Fox 5's Tyler Finger, who joins us live from outside the courthouse with the night's new details. Tyler? Hey, Tom, good evening to you. We learned shocking details about Colt Gray and his mental state when police say he shot and killed people inside Appalachia High School last month. Investigators say he meticulously planned his heinous act. He entered that classroom and proceeded to uh, fire the rifle into that classroom. Armed with an AR-15 style rifle, investigators revealed Wednesday alleged mass school shooter Colt Gray had a plan when he started his rampage inside Appalachia High School last month. GBI agents say Colt wrote it out in several notebooks and even drew some sketches. We also found another notebook um, in that same room. It was a drawing of a rifle with what appears to be ammunition coming out of it and then the word kids. Investigators said Colt didn't just plan how he was going to take lives, but how many families he would shatter. Under the classroom column is written 15 to 17 killed, injured, question mark, two to three. Um, further down the page is written classroom two, three to five killed, injured, two to three. And in parentheses off to the side, it says, surprise if I make it this far. Agents say family members knew about Colt's deteriorating mental state, but he didn't adequately get the help he needed. Prosecutors ultimately charged Colin with a number of counts, including involuntary manslaughter. Agents testified Colin knew what was going on, then still bought Colt a gun, ammunition, and other accessories. In that body camera when he was talking to you, did he appear to express any remorse about what had happened? No, he did not. Investigators say Colt had what they describe as a shrine dedicated to past school shooters. A GBI agent said Colt's mom and dad knew he obsessed over them, but felt he was just joking. Colt's mom, Marcy Gray, told the GBI her son asked his dad to buy a, quote, shooter mask. And when she asked him why he needed that, he stated in a joking manner, what? I've got to finish up my school shooter outfit. Just kidding. Wow. Hey, yo, drama. Hold up. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Stop the motherfucking record. All right.
I want you to Pondy replay drama. Pondy replay. <laughs> <laughs> Give him one more chance, man. Run that shit the fuck back. Investigators say Colt had what they describe as a shrine dedicated to past school shooters. A GBI agent said Colt's mom and dad knew he obsessed over them, but felt he was just joking. Colt's mom, Marcy Gray, told the GBI her son asked his dad to buy a, quote, shooter mask. And when she asked him why he needed that, he stated in a joking manner, what? I've got to finish up my school shooter outfit. Just kidding. And after hearing all of this, the judge determined that there was probable cause for Colin to stand trial. Meantime, a grand jury is set to meet here tomorrow to determine that the father and son should be indicted on more charges. Tom and Courtney. Yeah, some alarming testimony, Tyler, uh, in court today. Besides those drawings and writings, do we know of any other evidence that prosecutors have? Yeah, Tom, that's a really great question. I think prosecutors definitely have a lot of evidence to work with in this case. One of the other things they mentioned that they have is surveillance video. So think about it. On a school campus, there are cameras. And not only were there camp uh, cameras in the hallway, but there were also cameras actually inside the classroom, which was uh, shocking to me. So they actually have video of the actual shooting happen happening inside at least one of these classrooms. Uh, and again, those uh, pieces of writing and also those sketches are something that they're going to be able to uh, use and be able to present to a jury when this does eventually go to trial. And one of the things we weren't able to mention in that story was a piece of evidence that they gathered at the home of Colt Gray, which was a crumbled up piece of notebook paper. I'm reading it off my notes here, which they said, uh, it said, quote, expletive, this life of mine. Obviously, prosecutors are going to be using that to show his state of mind when all of this unfolded on that campus of Appalachia High School mm. last month. Yeah, Guys, back to you. The details are just so chilling. Tyler, thanks. Stop using and selling drugs to one another. See, we're getting ready to be put in a real trap with this legalization of marijuana. So everybody, every black person can be unemployed and then they can sit in their corner and get high on marijuana with whatever they decide to put in it. And people won't be asking for jobs and being determined that they're going to get jobs and going to get an education. No, everybody can start getting high on marijuana because somebody said it's medicinal and it's legal. What about so we better beware. What about the people who say the legalization of marijuana is fighting against racism because you have so many black people who are unjustly incarcerated as a result of racist enforcement of these drug laws? So this would be a good thing, and it would keep black people out of greater confinement. No, we can, we can do it by stop using and selling drugs to one another. See, if I'm not using drugs, then I can't be incarcerated for drugs. And I see so many males, young males in my practice who would become psychotic, almost never to return to normal from marijuana use because you don't know what's in it. Though vaping among teens is on the decline, a recent government report shows that a million and a half kids in the U.S. are still using e-cigarettes. In New York, where it's illegal to sell vaping products to anyone younger than 21, and flavor products are banned, many teens continue, though, to find ways to vape. 18-year-old Radio Rookies reporter Nora Durgham looks into how easy it is to get addicted and the impact of vaping on young people. Wait, you have a drug drug jar? Yeah, this is the drug drawer. Okay. We got a bunch of clips. Bunch I of first met my friend Eli at a house party tobacco, last year. He was leaning tobacco, against a wall, inhaling a mint flavored vape. I asked him, oh, can I hit that? We bonded over e-cigarettes and became friends. And a uh, bunch of vapes, maybe like... I remember that one at the party yeah, when I first met you. We have, what, four vapes? I have like seven vapes. In his bedroom, vapes are scattered everywhere. If he can't find one, another will always pop up when he needs it, which is often. How integrated has vaping become for you? Every day, um, every minute, every hour, multiple puffs. I go through like one of these a day. It's bad. It's pretty bad, yeah. Eli says he started vaping when he was 13. That was five years ago. 
He asked me not to use his last name because he's worried about being judged at school or by future employers. I remember the first time I vaped, I started tweaking out because I thought my throat was burning. Um, I got really scared. My first time was way different. It was back in 11th grade. I went to the girl's bathroom with my friend because she wanted to hit her vape. I saw the other girls vaping there too. I was curious, so I tried it. It made me feel like I was floating. The rush felt addictive because it is. Most vapes, also known as e-cigarettes, contain nicotine, a stimulant found in tobacco. It causes your brain to feel more dopamine, or in other words, pleasure. Here's more of what Eli remembers about his first time. It was a mix between both of me just like being high for the first time and feeling like Nick high, the Nick rush in my head. And I remember that was so painful. It felt like a brain freeze, but like five times more. I quit vaping earlier this year, but a lot of people I know are still hooked. Like my 17-year-old friend, Nadi, she also asked me not to use her last name because she doesn't want her family or the colleges she applies to to know she vapes. Have you considered the long-term effects it has on a person's health? I mean, yeah, I've like looked up the side effects of like, I don't know if popcorn lungs are real, but like that was like the first thing that really scared me and put things into perspective. And I have this cough that literally won't go away. So I'm scared of cancer, but you know, YOLO, like you only live once. I've also had difficulty breathing and shortness of breath that I got over a year of vaping. For a while, I'd also get nicotine sick. I'd feel nauseous, start shaking, get very hot and start sweating. I did some research and learned it's more than just feeling sick and having trouble breathing. At this age, our brains are still developing, and nicotine exposure actually changes the way our brain develops. And as a result of those changes, younger people have problems with attention, have problems with memory, and have problems with cognitive flexibility. That's John Patrick Allen. He's a researcher and professor at Rutgers University. He studies corporate influences on public health, and specifically how tobacco companies market vapes and other products to young people. Kids like flavors. Adults seem to like flavors too, but oftentimes these flavors seem to be very much targeted towards young people with flavors like cotton candy and fruit punch and, you know, peanut butter crunch. I remember this one flavor called Summer Blast, and it was mango, pineapple, and watermelon. If you were to put all three in a smoothie, that's kind of how it would taste. So if it's so unhealthy, why do so many teens keep doing it? My 18-year-old friend Kevin says he started vaping when he moved here from Korea for high school. He also asked me not to use his last name because he doesn't want any future employers to know he vapes. Kevin says he first tried it at a party because it seemed like all the cool people were vaping. But he knows it's not good for him. I am very much aware of what might do to me in the future but also at the same time like everybody does it you know like you're not going to be the only one who's getting like all these bad effects like everybody's going to get it so it's like our life my friend eli says he wants to quit but it's not easy there's nothing that can get me off of this i've tried the gum i've tried um patches you know zins um none of them have worked for me yeah i i don't know i just can't stop for me, I kept myself busy to keep my mind off of vaping, and I'm still doing that now in my first year of college. Homework, sports, playing drums, and spending time with people I love. No vaping. For WNYC, I'm Radio Rookies reporter Nora Durgam. You know, First Ladies usually have a cause, and you've already said you're interested in speaking out against bullying on social media. I think it's very important because a lot of uh, children and teenagers are getting hurt and we need to teach them how to talk to each other, how to treat each other and uh, to, to be able to connect with each other on the right way. It's an ironic choice since her own husband sent out a stream of pretty nasty tweets during the campaign. There is a growing concern that social media is harmful to kids' mental health. Almost all indicators of poor mental health and suicidal thoughts and behaviors got worse from 2013 to 2023, according to a Center for Disease Control and Prevention survey of more than 20,000 high school students. More than half of teenage girls reported feeling sad or hopeless in 2023, and nearly a third reported seriously considering suicide. Lawmakers and parents are calling for limits on social media to help combat this. 
The problem is, no one really knows how significant of a role social media plays in youth's emotional state, which makes it hard to tell if limiting exposure to these platforms will make things better. Our reporter Nidhi Subaraman joins us now to talk about this. So what evidence is out there to support the link between the rise in reports of poor mental health and social media? This is a great question and one that lots of scientists who are very smart have been trying to tackle. It's a complicated one to answer because social media encompasses many things. It could be like a DM that you send to a friend, or it might be watching multiple reels on Instagram for a long period of time. So a couple of groups, because parents and lawmakers, et cetera, are concerned about what social media is doing to kids, have looked at the abundance of studies that have tried to examine this question and have found, much to their frustration, that the evidence is pointing a little bit in different ways and is a little bit weak. Some studies find a weak link between depression and the use of social media. So one of them was a CDC analysis of the survey that they did with high school kids and found that high school kids who frequently use social media were more likely to report feeling persistently sad or hopeless last year. But that's just what they call an association, which means that they don't know whether it was the social media use that was to blame for the feeling that the high school kids reported in the survey. So teasing apart all of the factors has been a challenge, and the evidence is mixed, is what major reports have said. Nidhi, one element I find really fascinating about this is the idea of the relationship between mental health and tech being kind of this two-way street. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that works and how it impacts research into the effects of social media? Yes. One of the things that makes unpacking this question tricky is that mental health is kind of a complicated thing to treat. Each person experiences a different way, and the thing that sparks symptoms might be different for different people. And some studies, when you bring in the use of social media, have suggested that perhaps people who are more prone to certain behaviors or certain conditions like depression might be using the app more, which in turn would influence what effect they got from it. How have the approaches to sharing data from social media companies affected researchers' ability to look into this kind of thing? The way that scientists would ideally approach looking at the effect of one thing over another is to observe it. They like observational studies over surveys, but there's no great way to really observe this when individual people are looking at individualized feeds and uh, one person's use may be different from another person's use. And the access they have to the data that the companies have has been a point of frustration. Companies have been encouraged to share more or give researchers more access to data about the way people are using their platforms so that academics can independently assess to the extent they can from the outside some of the effects that these are having. We know, as our colleagues have reported, that some companies, Meta in particular, does research internally, which it hadn't shared, that was examining some of these questions. And the push has been for outside researchers who have the independence to talk about the results to be able to get some level of access to data as well. I'll just note that a spokeswoman for Meta said the company has new data tools and a pilot program started this year with the Center for Open Science, a research nonprofit, will share Instagram data with academic researchers. Uh, Representatives for YouTube, TikTok, Snap, and X also said they had tools or programs for researchers. So, Nidhi, according to scientists you spoke to then, does the research that's out there now support putting restrictions on social media to improve mental health? Researchers and health officials don't mean for you to look away from the issue. Just because this is a hard question to answer and in some ways an impossible one to prove harm and cause across a huge population doesn't mean there aren't things to do today. Uh, That doesn't mean that you can't tackle some questions at home and perhaps fund and uh, do more research that gets at this with some clarity. One of the pediatricians I spoke with is part of the American Academy of Pediatrics, which has a whole checklist of things that parents can do to decrease the risk that their kids find on the platforms, including 
talking about the kinds of content that they're sharing or having times during the day when you don't have phones or screens or apps available or setting habits, being an example to your kids. That was our reporter, Nidhi Subaraman. These people making the rest of us feel like we don't belong. But they know better than us. Look at how they treat their children. Mark my words, Mr. Resendez. If it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a village to abuse one. A landmark settlement has been reached tonight with the Catholic Archdiocese of Los Angeles to settle more than 1,300 claims of childhood sexual abuse. The Archdiocese will pay $880 million to victims, making it the largest single child sex abuse settlement with the Catholic Archdiocese. KTLA's Alina Bovia joins us live in downtown L.A. with more. Alina. Hi, good evening. That's right. We're talking about nearly $900 million for this settlement tied to 1,300 cases of childhood sexual abuse and all of them relating to the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Now, this goes back decades for nearly a century. And the reason it took so long for all this to happen is because of the newly enacted California Assembly Bill 218, AB 218, which provided a three-year window to revive some of these civil claims of past sexual abuse involving minors. Now, this this is the largest single child sex abuse settlement with a Catholic, Catholic archdiocese involving more than 100 priests, some of them facing criminal charges going back to the 1950s to present. In 2007, the L.A. Archdiocese settled sex abuse lawsuits on behalf of approximately 500 victims for $660 million. According to published reports, more than 3,000 lawsuits alleging sexual abuse of children have been filed in California against Catholic institutions under AB 218. Of the remaining cases, approximately 1,600 have been filed in Northern California, 500 in San Diego County, and about 200 in Orange County. The Diocese of Oakland, San Francisco, Sacramento, Santa Cruz, and San Diego have filed bankruptcy protection in the wake of these lawsuits. We've had a lot of survivors that have passed away while waiting for this uh, result. But to his credit, the Archbishop stepped up uh, and unlike other dioceses throughout the state of California and across the nation, didn't file bankruptcy. You know, I really feel that uh, no amount of money is going to make right the wrong of innocence being stolen. And to ensure that the victims in this case are paid out, we're told that the archdiocese, they are tapping into their reserve to fund it. That is the very latest. I'm Lena Boven here in downtown L.A., KTLA 5 News. Alina, thank you. Listen, just touching on some real issues right here tonight. That's, That's all. That's all. That's I all want y'all to observe the excellence here. BX providing the Sonics, my man, Minnesota. I'm letting the beat ride out because it's a part that I like when it come up. You know what I'm saying? I take this time to say what's up to my family. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that? You know what I'm saying? For sure. Just observe the excellence of that. That's many. Hey, back. Fall back. Uh-uh, with the guitars. It's hip-hop music. It's good enough to speak for itself. And you got to do right by it. Minnesota. Ain't no black people in Minnesota. The South Washington County School District banned a substitute teacher from its schools this week after the instructor reportedly used a Woodbury High School student to reenact police actions that led to the murder of George Floyd. And here to tell us more, education reporter Elizabeth Shockman. Hello, Elizabeth. Hey, Tom. Tell us more about the incidents that led to this teacher being removed from the school. Well, this is something that happened on Monday this week. A substitute teacher was leading four English classes at Woodbury High School, during which district officials say he, quote, thought students would want to hear about his life as a police officer, end quote. He allegedly made racist and sexist comments to students, shared explicit details about sexual assault cases and disturbing details about dead bodies. He twisted a student's arm behind the student's back, fake punched a student and mimicked pointing a gun at students. He also reportedly reenacted the murder of George Floyd, which included putting a student on the ground in front of the class and told students, quote, police brutality isn't real, end quote. That quote, as well as the details I just mentioned, come from the district's letter to parents. I mean, how did the school learn about this and what steps did they take? 
The students left their class on Monday and went straight to the principal's office to report what happened. Woodbury principal Sarah Sorensen Wagner told me she immediately went to the classroom, spoke to the substitute in her office, and then had him escorted from the building. I'm mortified and horrified that something like this happened in my school. It is not acceptable, and we're going to do everything we can to ensure that it never happens again. Um, I've been a principal for 11 years, and I've never experienced something like this. And I'm so proud of the students who reported it right away and who came forward, who are worried about their peers. The district has since banned the substitute from its buildings, reported him to the Minnesota Department of Education and the State Teacher Licensing Bureau, as well as the Woodbury Police Department. Do we know any more about who this person is and how he ended up in a classroom? The district and the police department have not released this substitute teacher's name. They said he had not worked as a police officer in Minnesota, but thought perhaps he'd worked as one in Wisconsin. But we've not been able to confirm that. School officials say he had been used as a substitute in the district seven times since last March, including earlier this year at Woodbury Middle School. But this week was the first time concerns about him were reported. He was hired by a company called Teachers on Call, which the district contracts with to help find substitute instructors. I contacted that vendor earlier today, and they told me the man is no longer employed there. The district superintendent, Julie Nielsen, says the incident is causing them to consider their substitute contracts. The Woodbury Police Department says it's investigating the incident and working closely with the district. And do you know how the students who were affected by this, how are they doing I spoke with the principal about, about this uh, a few hours ago. She has talked to all three classes involved in the incident, and the district has sent communications out to parents and community members. It sounds like students have been taking opportunities to process this with her and other teachers and counselors at the school. Here's what the principal, uh, Sorensen Wagner, told me. That's what we'll continue to focus on as a school, how if something happens in a classroom that is not doesn't feel right, Um, that they know is wrong, how to simply stand up and walk out and get help. The school has informed its teachers about the incident. It sounds like they're encouraging students to trust their intuition on this and get help from trusted adults. Elizabeth Shockman, our education reporter, reporting on an incident uh, at Woodbury High School where a substitute instructor used a high school student to reenact police actions that led to the murder of George Floyd. Elizabeth Shockman, thank you. Thanks for having me. When you're a cop, you can torment freely and see me valley, then seize the Audi, then beam proudly, turn a routine traffic stop to your season finale when you're a cop. The Irva and Police Department recently bought a $150,000 Tesla Cybertruck to promote its D.A.R.E. drug outreach program. The department says that truck is meant to really get your attention, but critics say it's unnecessary and a waste of taxpayer money. Our O.C. Oracle and L.A. Times columnist Gustavo Ariano is here to explain. Hey, Gustavo. Hola, Steve. What, what's the goal here for, for Irvine PD? Have they done something like this in the past? Are they trying to be all showy? <laughs> I know. Irvine, of all the cities in Orange County, Associated with showy, you never think of it. It's bland suburbia. It's the Irvine Company, Master Plan, Homeowner Association's hell. But there's a method to Irvine PD's madness. This Tesla police truck is going to be used for their participation in the D.A.R.E. program. You know, drug abuse, resistance education. This was a program that schools across the country used to do all the time to try to teach students the dangers of drugs. It turns out the only cities left in the in California that still employ this program, it, one of them is Irvine. Is is the cyber truck actually patrolling? Is it is it just for show? Irvine PD says that it's only going to be used for show specifically for these schools whenever you have a police officer for their D.A.R.E. program. And there is precedent to this within Irvine. This is something that they've been doing for the past 40 years. In the 1980s, they tricked out, you know, those old 80s pickup trucks with the oversized grill in the front and then the camper in the back uh, during the Chrysler PT era, those old those cars that kind of had that old school look. Uh, Irvine PD bought one of those to use as their show car. They even used uh, during the aughts, they had like one of those Kia Souls, those really boxy ones. So it must be working for them because they're continuing this tradition now with the Tesla truck. 
But what's the psychology here, Gustavo? I mean, is it do, do they think that the I mean, look, I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer or a naysayer in any of this because, you know, obviously it's an important function to to keep kids off drugs, right? But do the kids look at a Cybertruck and say, "Oh, well, I can have a Cybertruck if I don't do drugs." I mean, I I don't understand what the what the psychology is here. I'm not a member of the Irvine PD, so I do not understand the psychology as well. The critics are very upset about this. One of them is saying that Elon Musk has been very strident in his advocacy for former President Donald Trump to get reelected. So they're wondering why the Irvine PD would align itself with a company owned by a man like that. But look, I, it's funny you mentioned this because I was thinking of this earlier. A lot of kids, they like police officers they like to see all the little accoutrements that they have their canine units their cars and a tesla truck i personally think they're ugly but a lot of people think wow they're very futuristic and again the irvine pd has been doing this with a flavor of the year cars for a while if it did not get them the attention that they wanted from the kids at least at the very least to say hey kids you know look police officers we're pretty cool we know we know what the cool cars are if it if that didn't work for them even that psychological level they probably would not be doing this again and again do people i mean again we're talking one hundred fifty thousand dollars when it comes to taxpayer money are people lamenting the fact that you know hey because sometimes police departments will buy things used with money confiscated from drug deals, right? That's not the case here. Oh, no. Remember, we're talking about Irvine, uh, a very wealthy city in Orange County. This is not Los Angeles. This is not Santa Ana PD. This is not a place where the police department is begging for money from the public at large. They have the money to be able to spend this. And also, a lot of police departments have been criticized in recent years for buying uh, vehicles and other equipment from the military, you know, from uh, the wars that we have fought over the past 20 years. But this is not the case. This is just Irvine PD saying, hey, this is this goofy tradition we have. It's ultimately about uh, getting our police officers into schools with a car that's going to be a conversation starter with kids. And then from there, we could give them a message of, you know, bullying's not cool. Uh, drugs are not cool. But you know what's cool? A Tesla police truck and only Irvine does it. L.A. Times columnist Gustavo Ariano with our O.C. line this week. Gustavo, as always, thanks. Gracias. Because ugly white women used to say they got raped by niggas. <laughs> hey, a nigga raped me. Yeah, and the guys be going, hey, you sure? <laughs> yeah, they go round up some niggas, you know, like, oh, you were down last week, you know what to do, don't you? Well, come on down again, will you? We got to have a lineup. <laughs> you know, it was a lot of fun unless you got picked. That was your ass. <laughs> mm. Dear commissioners, this letter is submitted to respectfully request rescission of the August 8, 2024 decision finding Andrew Stewart Luster suitable for parole. Ventura parole County Grant District Attorney Eric Nazarenko reads from a letter he wrote to the Board of Parole Hearings. Because the inmate continues to pose an unreasonable risk to the public. In August, Max Factor heir Andrew Luster was granted permission for an early release from prison. Each of the inmates' three victims were drugged into unconsciousness and sexually assaulted by the inmate. But after Each a hearing yesterday, that decision was reversed. We want Andrew Luster to stay in state prison until his maximum confinement date. In the late 1990s, Luster preyed upon women primarily in Santa Barbara, drugged and raped them at his home in Muscle Shoals. He was convicted of 86 felony counts and, says Nazarenko, he considers him to still be a threat. These were violent, horrific crimes, drugging multiple women into unconsciousness and in that state raping and sodomizing them. We believe, based upon the Board of Parole hearings, that he continues to minimize his conduct, not take full responsibility for his actions, and that he continues to represent to Ventura County and other California counties a ongoing and unreasonable public safety risk. One of Luster's victims, Tonya Bolden, waived her anonymity and spoke at the hearing. It's scary in some ways because I do have family members and friends say, what if you really upset him? What if, you know, he wants to come after you because of this? And I guess if that happens, that happens. But I feel so compelled to change things when I see that they're unjust and unfair. Nazarenko praised the bravery of the victims who spoke at the hearing. The three women who were victimized came forward and gave 
strong, courageous statements in opposition to parole. Their voices were integral, I believe, in the recommendation that was handed down yesterday. Luster became eligible for parole after a change in the law which made those convicted of non-violent crimes eligible for parole under California law. Astonishingly, the rape of an unconscious person was, under that law, classified as non-violent. The unfortunate thing is he still gets out uh, Halloween 2026, so he's still going to be getting out without serving his full sentence. Baldwin hasn't just been pivotal in the reversal by bravely speaking out about her attacker, but earlier this month was successful in getting a bill signed by Governor Gavin Newsom, which closes that legal loophole around the rape of an unconscious person, impacting on sentencing and parole in the future. I was able to work with this wonderful senator to help get this bill passed. When you use your voice like that, you can actually, that would have never happened. Talking about the crime that happened to you, that's not about sex. It's about power. And actually, you're the one who's taken your power, taken your voice, and used it. You've become the powerful one because of what happened to you. Yes, that is exactly how I think of it. And that's why I don't like to refer to myself as a victim of rape. I'm a survivor of that. Gosh, I just want to, I get, I, sometimes I want to cry because it's more out of like the gratitude that I feel that my efforts have come to fruition. Andrew Luster is scheduled to complete his sentence at the end of October 2026. And until then, Nazarenko says he intends to protect the public from him for as long as the law will allow. In Ventura, Caroline Faraday. KCLU News. The man, the man not. Race, race, class, class genre, genre, and the dilemmas, the dilemmas of black manhood. Six, six, some breaking news. Case dismissed against a man at the center of this violent arrest in Phoenix. The ABC 15 investigators were the first to release this video to the public just one week ago. A Phoenix man who is deaf with cerebral palsy was punched and tasered by two Phoenix police officers back in August. We then took you inside the preliminary hearing where those officers testified they felt their actions were justified. Fast forward to this week when top leaders and community groups started speaking out about the controversial arrest after it gained worldwide attention. And breaking tonight, the Maricopa County attorney has announced charges against Tyrone McAlpin have now been dismissed. Yeah, Governor Katie Hobbs also taking action. She wants police across the state to get more training following our investigation into the violent arrest of McAlpin. More on the governor's call in a moment, but there are fast-moving developments since we first broke this story. New tonight, two state legislators demanded police and prosecutors drop the charges against McAlpin. So did the Democrat running for Maricopa County attorney. And again, just moments ago, the case was dismissed. The National Association for the Death also sending the city a scathing letter with a list of demands and the NAACP meeting with the Department of Justice on this case. That fallout is not stopping and that's because our chief investigator, Dave Biscoping, he broke the story and it's why the governor's office is now telling him they want immediate action. Dave. Yeah, that's right. We'll get to the governor's action in just a moment. But getting to this case dismissal, Tyrone McElpin was facing charges of aggravated assault and resisting arrest. And this just came in, this statement from County Attorney Rachel Mitchell. And this is what she wrote about her decision, decision to dismiss this case. I promised I would personally review the case, including a large volume of video recordings, police reports, and other materials that have been forwarded to my office. On Thursday of this week, I also convened a large gathering of senior attorneys and members of the community to hear their opinions as they pertain to the case. I have now completed my review and have made the decision to dismiss all remaining charges against Mr. McAlpin. And that leads us to the governor. She's also the one taking action because of our report. Taser, taser, taser. Phoenix police are investigating the way officers arrested Tyrone McAlpin, yelling commands and insulting him <laughs> as they repeatedly punched and tasered him. Put your hands behind your back! In response, the governor's office just released the following statement to ABC 15. Quote, Governor Hobbs is committed to protecting all Arizonans and is deeply concerned about the images from Mr. Tyrone McAlpin's arrest. While we await the investigation's results, 
The governor's office has directed AZ Post to issue reminders to all law enforcement agencies about the training created in partnership with the Arizona Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. This crucial training is designed to ensure law enforcement can engage effectively with individuals with disabilities. She urges all public safety personnel to participate in this training, even if it's not mandatory to prevent similar incidents. Move, move. After we broke the story, the Arizona Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing put out a statement saying they provided the Arizona Peace Officer Standards and Training Board the special training about communicating effectively with those who are deaf, but those trainings aren't being much utilized. And in court, here's what the two officers who arrested Tyrone said about their training. Uh, light training with people who are hard of hearing. Okay, can you tell me more about that? Uh, it was about seven years ago. I don't remember much of it. Have you received any training in dealing with members of the public who have disabilities? Maybe briefly, but nothing that I recall. Several disability rights organizations have noted the first officer goes after Tyrone immediately. So the problems in this case run deeper than a lack of training about deafness. But they underscore it's still vital since 1.1 million Arizonans are hard of hearing and 20,000 are culturally deaf. Now we also heard back from the state police board and they confirmed they've now reached out to every police agency in Arizona about the training. And when it comes to the internal investigation from Phoenix police into their officers involved, we're going to stay on top of that case and let you know what happens. Back to you. Let's see. Next story. I told a family member about potential election violence. They called this fake news. I said the report was from NPR and their response was silent. I believe the NPR report about uh, potential election day violence was on the cows for a uh, compensatory call in uh, this past Saturday, six days ago. Americans are three weeks away from election day. It was nearly four years ago that a violent mob overtook the Capitol after the last election. At one point on January the 6th, a CBC News crew got swept up in that story when Trump supporters swarmed them, forcing the network to cut away from the CBC's Katie Nicholson. Well, now Katie decided to try to track down one of the Trump supporters who harassed her that day. Here is Katie's documentary. January 6, 2021. Now it is up to Congress to confront this egregious assault on our democracy. I was on the ground near the ellipse and that South Lawn area of the White House. We're going to walk down. As then President Donald Trump urged his supporters to march right here, to the Capitol. We're going to walk down to the Capitol. And they did. We've all seen images of that day people scaling the Capitol, pushing their way inside. The calls to hang the sitting vice president, Mike Pence, and the assaults on police. I want to bring in the CBC's Katie Nicholson. She is in Washington near the Canadian At embassy. At 3.52 p.m., I was just a few blocks from the Capitol. I was live on CBC News Network. You know, we've been seeing an awful lot of people walking away from the Capitol building. And I was today. aware of a group of Trump supporters who were shouting and shaking their fists and their flags in the air. Uh, this was basically, that's me, I'm the fake news. Right. Uh, we had a security guard with us, and he was trying to de-escalate. I heard him tell them that we were a Canadian crew. It didn't help. I think I'll let these yeah, guys you know what? I'm gonna let. I kept going. We'd been heckled all day. It was nothing new. If I might finish. Go ahead. The rhetoric around the. But then they closed in. And whether or not. I felt a flag slap across my face as a protester walked in front of me. No, um, yeah, we're, we, 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 can't, we can't do that. The network sorry, cut away. We need, um, Katie Nicholson in Washington, we need to get her to a, a safe uh, situation. But we, uh... we picked up our gear and tried to move away as they encircled and taunted us. A woman in a white winter jacket accused me of spewing BS and said that our crew should run. After a few blocks, they lost interest. Walk our city. Walk our city. And within minutes, we were set up somewhere else. So, Katie, I know it's been a very long day for you. Walk us through what the latest is. 
Well, in fact, Adrian, I have moved because it was uh, a little too raucous uh, down in front of the Canadian. Ever since, I've been thinking about the people who surrounded us that day. I was curious who they were, what brought them there, whether their thinking had shifted, especially now heading into another highly volatile election. So I tracked down the woman in the white coat who said I was spewing BS and who told our crew that we ought to run. Her name is Tracy Danka. Pull in here. She lives in Calabash, North Carolina. Can this be it? And she invited me to her house. This is definitely the place. Danka's front yard is festooned with Trump flags. It's good to see you. It's a lot more chill than January hello, 6th, hello, isn't hello. it? Yeah. How are you? Good to meet you. This is Lee There's Lee also, Lee. surprisingly, a giant Harris Walls banner tied between two trees. Well, let me tell you, the only reason why there's a Harris is because I ordered that for my husband. Did you? Mm-hmm. But I made sure it was big. Yeah. That's right. She's married to a Democrat. We'll get to that a little later. Spinach and tomatoes from my garden. Smell that fresh spinach? Tracy is making spinach ravioli for seniors. She tries to do this once a week. Well, I guess it started years ago with our children, and, and we just felt it was important to give back to the community. Tracy was raised in Pennsylvania. Her parents were Democrats. She even voted for Obama. But something changed when Donald Trump came down that golden escalator in 2015. And we are going to make our country great again. I, I remember thinking that as sad as it is, our country is a business. And we needed a businessman running our country rather than a politician. Because these politicians would say and do whatever they needed to to talk to the person in front of them, where Donald Trump, you're fired, you're fired. I mean, come on now. Who does that? You know, do, do I agree with everything Donald Trump says? No. What, what don't you agree with? I don't agree that the wealthy should receive tax breaks. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't agree with that. But she does agree with Donald Trump's baseless claims the 2020 election was stolen even after dozens of court cases found no evidence. Even after Trump's own election officials said it was the most secure election in U.S. history. Do you believe that from a Trump appointee? No. I, I, I don't believe. You still have doubt? Yeah, I still have doubt. A big part of that doubt comes down to her distrust of news sources, which brings us back to that moment on January 6th. Around, I mean, when we um, encountered each other at the, at the Capitol, I was, it was about four o'clock, so it was just before um, Trump told everybody to leave. And I remember because I was, it was kind of like swarmed by, by Trump supporters, and everybody was quite hostile towards the journalists, right? I wasn't. You were. Yes. Was I? Yeah, you, mm. you told me I was spewing BS. Oh, yeah, I think I, yeah. But, I mean, I, why did you do that? Like, why did you think that I was... I, I, I'm curious about your relationship with media and trust of, of journalists. Turn on the TV. Are you kidding me? You know, I, I mean, look at the news. It's always, and Trump has done this, and Trump has done that, and the Republicans have done this, and the Republicans... But we report on everything that happens, right? So, like, it's... Some do, but not all. This is an act of trust, inviting a journalist into your home, mm -hmm. right? So on that day, it was clear you didn't trust. I didn't trust the journalist that day. Has anything changed for you? Because here I am sitting with you. I guess it's who the journalist is. I guess it's what their goal is and, and what they've said in the past and how they've portrayed people. So do I agree with all of them? Nope. Do I trust them all? Nope. Tracy cringes when I offer to show her what our cameras captured on January 6th. She isn't sure she wants to see it. It was just rude and uncalled for. As we watch the video, she shifts her weight uncomfortably and winces. Yeah, you're screwing this bullshit, but you know. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, nobody should attack anyone for doing their job, for, you know, speaking their mind, for reporting the news. So, 
Yeah, I would say I was wrong. Tracy, that, that 100 means a lot to me. One hundred percent. Thank you. You know, because no, no one should ever. You know, I, I tell people all the time. You know, oh, I'm so sorry. You should never apologize for doing your job, no matter what my opinion is. If it's your job and it's something you believe in, you should never apologize for doing it. But as a person who is a proud Republican and a Christian, how dare I? Tracy may not trust all journalists, but she trusts me enough to show me a bit of her life. As we hit the road to deliver her meals, Tracy tells me more about why she supports Donald Trump. I'm, wor I'm worried about war. I'm, I'm, I'm worried about us being involved in any wars. All this aid, where, where did we become the parents of the world? Let me tell you something. I have tenants. We own rentals. And when my tenants like, I lost my job, well, you know, I think that's great, but I'm not your mommy, so I'm not putting a roof over your head. Our first stop is Joe Nottis' house. He's a Vietnam vet and the staunch Trump supporter. Okay, Joe, I brought you seafood, pasta, oh my goodness, and I brought you the cheese and spinach raviolis. What are you hungry for? Which one do you want? Like Tracy, he still refuses to accept the results of the 2020 election, and he's worried what that means for this election. If this election goes bad, there's going to be a civil war. Most definitely. I have my doubts whether they're going to let President Trump into the White House if he does get elected. I foresee martial law. I don't even want to think about that. Well, hello! Our next stop, an elderly couple from Tracy's church. How are you? You look fabulous. Oh, you look always good, so... Yes, that's a French-Canadian accent. Francine Lazard Ailing is now an American citizen and a huge Trump supporter. In my opinion, it was a stolen uh, election. Are you are you worried about the integrity of this election? Do you think I am it? still yes I am. And I hope that they will have enough people standing up and and uh, watching on both sides. While there are many in Tracy's world who share her baseless but unshakable belief that the 2020 election was stolen, her husband Ed, a lifelong Democrat and retired steelworker, isn't one of them. So the 60 lawsuits that they filed mm -hmm. across the country, where they were all proved there was no interference, mm -hmm. and a lot of them were Republican officials that were involved. They all agreed there was no interference. That doesn't count. Uh. I mean, who you? If you can't trust the Republicans, can't can't trust them. Republic, Republic can't can't Repo trust them. Republic can't can't trust them. Apparently, because you don't trust them, you don't trust that they did what was right. No, I don't. Well, there you go. We're out in the Danka's backyard. Tracy and Ed are seated next to each other. The fault lines of America's political divide run deep, and right through their 26-year marriage. Oh my gosh. What happened on January 6th? Mm -hmm. We seem to have two very different versions, but that was an actual live broadcast. And I know what I saw. I saw people breaking into the Capitol building, uh, attacking officers. Uh, Which was 100% wrong. Trying to get into the cha Senate chamber mm -hmm. and, and get to the congressmen and senators where they had to flee for, basically for their lives. They were, they were scared, and I don't blame them because those mm -hmm. people were vicious yeah they were and, and the way they were attacking it was pretty disturbing I, even today four years later it's still i'll never forget it i mean that's something you don't forget he was at home but i was physically there and, and for me it was a show of support patriotism love you know when we went from where he was speaking over to the capitol you know we were told you know march in peace and and, and, and that's what it was. I didn't know she was that close to what was going on. Basically, she told me they took buses over there from Butler, mm -hmm. PA. And she told me whenever Trump was done speaking that they went back to the buses. Mm -hmm. I just recently found out He's mistaken. over the last day or so that she walked down to the Capitol building. I did. Yes, but that's not what you told me originally, honey. Now, we walked over towards the Capitol. I didn't go 
into the Capitol. I didn't say you did. But okay. What you told me was, after Trump was done speaking, we went back to the buses. No. Because... You're mistaken. Okay, I'm telling you the way I remember it. Okay. But January 6th is a sore spot, but even as they debate, they at times hold hands. My issue, my issue is the ones that actually broke inside the building mm -hmm. with the intent of stopping the procedure and then doing all that damage and injuring or, or killing for. guards and other people that were there. I mean, that's, if not, it's not insurrection, I don't know what is. I'm sorry, you lost, accept it. That's just the way politics work. Sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. And sometimes you have a whole bunch of people that are nine feet under that crawled up out of the grave and went and voted. Oh, wait, that was only in that well, election. Well, no, we're talking about two different things. I know. So that just proves the election was stolen. And are you worried about this country? Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah. of course we are. Like I said, whichever way it goes, there's going to be trouble. Either we, way, we, we have, he wins or loses, and it might be worse if he wins. <laughs> That's the scary part. I think it'll be worse if you he know, doesn't it's a win. Little bit old, that, chart. that chart's a couple of months old. And this election cycle has already been rocked by violence. Take a look at what happened. <laughs> On July 13th in Butler, Pennsylvania, a lone wolf, a registered Republican, fired off shots at Donald Trump before police shot and killed him. Tracy Baker, a childhood friend of Tracy Danka's, was there. We were four rows from the stage um, to his left. And um, all of a sudden, I hear this pop, pop. And I'm going, fireworks, firecrackers? It must be outside the venue. And I'm watching him. We're, we're looking at a, um, a graph showing all the illegal immigration and what have you. And then down he goes. I was like, oh. And then we all go down. There were chairs and people on top of people. And I'll tell you, when I hit the ground and I heard he's hit, my heart sunk. I thought, this is the end of our country as we know it. It, it, it was, it was, it was heart wrenching. And so, um. When I saw him get back up, it was just, it's just unbelievable. That must have been terrifying, everybody falling down and... It was absolutely terrifying. I, I had no idea. I'm thinking, how can I get, what am I going to do? There was, there was somebody on top of me, so I felt relatively safe. <laughs> but I was afraid to get up. I didn't know if I get up, am, am I going to get picked off? What, what's going to happen here? Um, so I waited to see the people in front of me get up so after they caught up hey, I, mean, I said okay we must be okay the two tracys go to trump rallies together she also marched to the capitol on january 6th and worries about what's to come this year the reason for all of these rallies is just what he said too big to rig and that's what it has to be yeah it has to be that and and i do believe that the 2020 election was stolen i do believe that mm -hmm. I'm very fearful of what, what could happen. You know, I hope that there's enough good people out there that can stop this stuff. It, it's, I just hope that there are. Hearing his wife and her friends cling to the big lie about the stolen election isn't easy for Ed. What do you need to do with these people to, for them to get it? To me, it's almost like a cult. You know, when you have a cult, no matter what that cult leader says, the members go along with it. They're, they're, they're mesmerized. He's somebody that, for whatever reason, a lot of these people cling to or want to be like. I, I don't know why. To me, it doesn't make any sense, but I'm me. I, I don't go along that easily. But other people are more susceptible, I think. I think that's why so many people are behind them. They're miles apart on their views on Donald Trump and election integrity, but Tracy and Ed say their marriage is solid. The last thing on earth we would ever allow is for people that we do not know personally to affect our marriage. We were married in a church under the eyes of God. And, and that's where our marriage is focused. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It's, um, 
we don't let it get too personal, let's put it that way. Family comes first, and then politics. We, all we can do is vote for who we think needs to be in that job and hope for the best. And may the better man or woman win. Before we leave, Tracy throws a dinner party. Tracy's setting the table. She's slicing the prime rib and mashing potatoes. Edward sits here at the head of the table. So you're welcome to sit anywhere you like. I don't okay, very sit good. Near my Amanda Howard is one of Tracy's guests. She's a small business owner and Trump supporter. But even she is ready to be talking about something, anything else. I'm ready for the new normal. <laughs> Whatever the new normal is, I'm ready. I'm ready for people to go about their lives, things to be back to normal. I'm ready for inflation. Amanda, would you grace us with grace? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for friends and family. And we pray that you bless this food to the nourishments of our body and our body to thy service. Amen. 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 Thank you. So we have salad with... It's an almost Norman Rockwell moment of normal ahead of what could be a chaotic November. And of course there's... It was, after all, political unrest that brought me here to Tracy's world. So I have to ask her, if there's another January 6th, would she go back to the Capitol? You know, my husband will back me 110% in anything I do. But not when there's danger out there, honey. Yeah. Because now you know it's there. You didn't know it before. Yeah. Four years ago, but now you know what's capable, what, what they're capable of. So I'm going to say no. The man, the man not, not race, race class, class genre, genre and the dilemmas, the dilemmas of black manhood. black manhood and staying with the race for the white house vice president kamala harris has unveiled a new economic agenda that is specifically tailored to black men the plan includes forgiving one million business loans creating more apprenticeships and studying diseases that disproportionately impact african-american men the Opportunity Agenda for Black Men also includes legalizing recreational marijuana to create a booming industry. Harris announced the plan in the battleground state of Pennsylvania, which she visited for the 10th time this election season. The announcement comes days after former President Barack Obama criticized black men in person, saying they weren't fond of the idea of having a woman as president. Up with all kinds of reasons and excuses, I've got a problem with that because, because part of it makes me think, and I'm speaking to men directly now, part of it makes me think that, well, you just aren't feeling the idea of having a woman as president. Mm -hmm. And you're coming up with other alternatives and other reasons for that. His contentious remarks followed growing concerns of eroding support among black men for Kamala Harris just weeks before the November 5th election. Recent polls show that black men are less enthusiastic about the Democratic presidential ticket, and they may sit out this election or support former President Donald Trump. You have to be careful with recognizing that African-American men have the same needs as any other male in voting, making decisions for their family, um, having wealth for their children, um, economic issues, cost of food, and so you don't want to offer like a carrot, you know, a, a bait for people to vote for you and not really pay attention to what the issues are. And so um, it could be possibly backfire if, if, if the male uh, population feel that they're trying to be um, convinced beyond policy to vote for her instead of her really standing on the issues um, that really present themselves to African-American males. Young black men in particular are turning away from the Biden-Harris administration as their experiences are not reflected in the policies. Right now, I would definitely vote for Trump. Uh, the reason why I would vote for Trump, uh, Trump is offering more tangibles that uh, some or most black Americans think that will benefit our community, such as immigration, uh, the way immigration is running under the Democratic uh, time, time right now um, is, is hurting our economy.
because we have millions of people come in, they're reaping the benefits such as Medicaid, Medicare, uh, DHS. They're receiving all these benefits that so many our our elders, our retired military that may be homeless and the regular homeless people, they can't get these benefits, but we're giving it to people who never put into the system. So that's a huge problem for me and I know a few other people. Meanwhile, during a rally in Pennsylvania on Monday, Donald Trump celebrated the increasing support from the black community, adding that if he wins the swing state, he will, in fact, win the whole ball game. Tell you what, our poll numbers have gone through the roof with black and Hispanic have gone through the roof. And I like that. I like that. I like that. We win Pennsylvania. We win this great commonwealth. We are going to win the whole ball game. It's such an important place. And we relate. And, and we are up in the polls fairly nicely. The latest poll averages by the New York Times show Kamala Harris leading Donald Trump by one point in Pennsylvania and by three points nationally. Yet for nearly five decades, black men have historically voted overwhelmingly for Democrats and specifically their support has ranged anywhere from 85 to 95 percent for Democratic presidential candidates. This year, Kamala Harris is fighting to ensure those percentages remain intact as the race grows even more tight with exactly three weeks until Election Day. Tyrone, if things do not go out, don't work out correctly next month, election results, call Tyrone. Lame excuses not to support your vice presidential sister. Mm, mm, mm. Context of white supremacy. <clears throat> Privileged. Worthless. Black male from Virginia. Me and Tyrone. In for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information with non-white people, victims of white supremacy on the global system of white supremacy racism, what it is and how it works. Not for white people. They do not need remedial counter-racism classes. Today's date, Saturday, October 19, 2024. So I have been told our weekly compensatory call-in not for spectators Dial in if you have thoughts, observations, counter-racist suggestions, election counter-racist experiments, perhaps. Let us know the number 605-313-5164, the code 564-9. Three pound press star six one if you would like to participate. Number again six oh five three one three five one six four the code five six four nine four three pound press star six one if you would like to participate number again 605 313 5164 the code 564 943 pound press star 61 if you would like to participate few things before we get to it. One, listener-supported counter-racist radio. Invest if you think the cows is constructive. Hit the blog racism-notes.blogspot.com racism-notes.blogspot.com PayPal button in the top right corner. Beneath the button, you'll see the links for PayPal, Cash App, and Venmo. The Venmo or excuse me, cash app address, cash.app forward slash dollar sign the cows. 
enormous gratitude to all of the investors who have kept us broadcasting for 15 plus years. Hopefully we have been worthy of your time and energy. Accurate more often than not. A few constructive tidbits, suggestions on things non-white people can and should do to replace white supremacy with justice immediately. You can also invest. Hit the Amazon wish list. It is under Gus T. Renegade. Much obliged for all the folks who have nabbed an item or three over the years. Hopefully we have been worthy of your time and energy. Now to a few of the tidbits. Number one, in case something happens, I get struck dead. There's a monsoon or other natural disaster of some sort. Um, Andrew Stewart Luster is classified as white unless I'm greatly misinformed. Make sure I get that in, have that listed later. But the convicted serial rapist in California is a white man. I used the Richard Pryor intro about, you know, they go to get black males. And you know you did it, Tyrone. You know you did it, Leroy. But that is a white man. I've never even heard of this dude. It's serial rapist and all of this. Like, we pause on Bill Cosby. Maybe we pause on Diddy for a second. It's like, whoa, all of this. And then... Matter of fact, never mind. I just want to make sure I get that right there. This is a white man. Now we can go back in order from reports popping up from the week. Now, the Greenwood Cemetery report in St. Louis, Missouri. Raphael Morris and his wife, Shelley Morris, black cemetery in St. Louis that they said was in super disrepair and they had to go out with lawn mowers and push mower. I don't even know if people have seen those. Like if you're 20 under, have you even seen a push mower? Oof. And especially, I can't even imagine trying to use that in an area of Missouri. If it's un- overgrown and uh, hasn't, you haven't had any groundskeeping or anything for a while. Like, oh my, they, they even said like, man, we would go out there and work. We'd get to the end of the day and wouldn't even be on speaking terms. I can imagine you got all kinds of calluses and hot and dehydrated and muscles are, oh my God, you got to do all that. And how many times have we heard that burial places for black people try and in fact, <clears throat> Mr. Morris, he said, when he was talking, he said <clears throat> they would go clean up and everything and then you go back out to the black cemetery and you find out that someone has left the place has been flooded with bags of whatever I said wait a minute now wait a minute that that sounds something like deliberate like is this usual suspects race soldiers they just come and dump bags trash broken toilets Whatever other type of refuse they just dump it all over the black cemetery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're trying to clean up. Well, clean this up too. <laughs> That's just what they got whole books about that desecration of black burial. That's in medical apartheid and uh, Ramey ba- Dana Ramey Berries. I mean, it's just tons of records. We had guests on the program, Dr. Sean Utsi. He was a guest on the program last year. Whole documentary films about that digging up black burial grounds and cover it over with a highway or something else total disrespect of the ancestors and deliberately so Uh, let's see the segment on the hurricanes that they are worse now that whole segment they didn't say nothing about Katrina nor did they mention racism but they said that the usual inequalities before the flood the wind the tornado all of those inequalities would exist and then they went into the elderly and children importantly children that weren't even born at the time of Katrina or Ivan or Milton their health being impacted by those storms wow that is something to consider that I said I remember saying that with Katrina like even I think if I had been born here I would have to get up out of here like there is no way I could go through this year after year like unless we live in a fortress we own the property rights and we live far away from the water that we don't have to worry about you know 
uh, when they have storm surge and all the rest of it. So we're not quite on the water in Louisiana. And then if it does flood, we got an elevated house and all that. And we got a great solar generator. So if the power goes out for six months, we good. We got water, the, all of that. Like we would have to have all kinds of like psh, ancestors hooked it up. We got all of the codes. We got all of the answers. We got security set up on the property. We all know how to use firearms. So if looters come, psh, we got the sign out already. Looters will be shot. If we don't have that, I'm not staying in one of these places like permanently. You gotta be joking. <laughs> like, that's just me. I know we got people that live there. I could not do it. Not for all the tea in China. And then that report like that. I remember that even with Katrina, they talked about the elderly where they had so many older black people were because of white supremacy racism. They had diabetes and high blood pressure and obesity and all the rest of it where they were not able. Like when the floodwaters and everything came. Okay, when it gets to the point where we got to try to get out, we have to we might have to walk, you know, five miles in 90 degree heat through flood water to get to a safe spot. They had a lot of elderly black people. They could not do it. Not healthy enough. That's one I would, you know, kind of remind folks like that's one of the reasons why we talk about taking care of your health and all the rest of it. When these bad situations happen, it's all of the things like being financially not well off. If the storm hits and you got enough money saved up where you can go and just get a really nice hotel in another state over, go to Texas, kick it for a few months, go to Arkansas and kick it for a month. Well, you kind of had a nice vacation, you know, work remotely and whoop you do. If that is not the case, oh man, same thing with health. You had diabetes and high blood pressure and all the rest of it prior to asthma, prior to all of this, oh buddy. And then the storm hits, do you get to see your normal doctor? They said that with Katrina, people got displaced. Do you get to see your normal doctor? Can you get your prescription filled? Maybe, maybe not. I remember that. I remember that we spent so much time studying Katrina where they said, man, depends on how you count a Katrina death. If someone survives the storm and then six months later, they die because their hospital records got lost and they had difficulty getting new service and didn't get the right medication and all the rest of it and died. Now, is that a Katrina death? Yep. But they didn't count a lot of those, you know, that way. Uh, let's see the. In Atlanta. They had the fire out at the suburban lab facility. The chemical TCCA was released and they said it had the chlorine smell. This is something I guess they use to clean hot tubs and all that probably for lots of people classified as white in the Atlanta area. And they said you could smell now just the language alone in that report. They said that they got the tests in. We came and we checked the air and hey, everything is all right not going to be a problem for most people <laughs> pause <laughs> like what what does that mean who is most people cuz sometimes they'll be tricky that'll mean well according to our results 60% of the people will live that would be most people what's going to happen to the other 40% mm. Like, wait a minute, wait a minute, you said most people going to get it, yeah, according to the data, 60%, most people, didn't you hear what we said? They do old, you know, funky stuff like that and see racist and see Atlanta, I know about Atlanta, I lived in Atlanta, I am so, there has never been one millisecond where I've ever said, oh man, I sure do miss my black brothers in Atlanta. Never. There's not been one millisecond where I said, man, I should have stayed in Atlanta. H-E-L-L, -L, no. Atlanta was notorious for having bad air quality before this happened. They have bad air alerts all the time. And then it's high heat that just makes it worse. It's not summertime now, but in the summer, it just makes, makes it worse. And then you have this to happen. Come what a terrible 
thing to wear. Is that two time for Harriet A. Washington? Two times to have this filtering throughout the metropolitan Atlanta area. Man. Man. And the Senate, I, even I thought when they said all that, the Centers for Disease Control is right there. The very people that should be the best to make sure this sort of thing doesn't happen to begin with. And then they go in and clean up, make sure everybody got respirators and all the rest of it and do tests and right there, headquarters. I also thought, dang, isn't that the background? Walking Dead, they got the facility in Atlanta, they try to go break into the city and all that. I also thought, because I got the book right there, Melanin Apocalypse, Daryl Bain guest on the cows in winter of 2011 what is melanin apocalypse about fiction i guess uh science fiction at that where they have some sort of chemical outbreak in atlanta and it turns negras into zombies who still want to rape white women that's melanin apocalypse daryl bain was on the program to talk about that one but i did think of that with all this i don't think it's that dramatic i guess uh staying in georgia colt 45 gray man timing beautiful we had i had some race soldier on social media i've never been a fan of social media regardless if i wasn't doing the broadcast i wouldn't even be on any of that stuff some loon potential race soldier on social media started messaging me out of the blue i don't even contact people on social media i don't follow people none of that stuff i just post my content leave people alone united independent person starts posting me and said hey man most of the school shooters are black people now i give an eyebrow raise because this is something that we've talked about now he posts a jamas journal of journal of american medical association he posts an article uh where it has this nonsense about most of the school shootings being black people. Now, you have to pause with that data because they're counting any sort of shooting that happens at a school. Even that shooting that happened in Virginia where it was a six-year-old where he took a gun to school and they ended up charging his black mother. People remember that one? That was from last year, 2023. That is not no deal Reb, we came to blow up the whole school and kill everybody here. That is not that at all. Some six-year-old taking a gun to school. Ooh, look what I got. Whoa, oh, bang. And I actually shot somebody. Now, he didn't kill anybody there, but that is not the same at all. Now, if you do think this is about the same thing, you know, whatever, shooting is a shooting, victims guaranteed qualified. But when they do the studies and results, they get very specific when they start talking about school shootings. That is not the same thing. Even in the documentary Bowling for Columbine, they show about the same thing. A like six year old, seven year old, really, really young black person taking a gun to school and they shoot and kill, I think like a one of their peers, like a six six year old, seven year old white student. They make that a big part. That is not the same thing, is we sat and planned this for a year, two years. We went out and practiced shooting. We made a schematic of the school. Only one group does that. Name the black people that go out and do this. Now, I don't do, and one of the reasons that I'm not big on social media, I'm not going back and forth with anybody on social media. White person, non-white person, it could be a bot, it could be a race soldier. Time and energy. Time and energy. Period. If you don't agree, deuces. Peace. I'm not even following you. I don't even know who you are. Deuces. Now, he posts Peter Langman. I know Peter Langman. We talked about this point explicitly. I backed him down. That's another reason I don't waste time. I'm not no coward. I'm not no keyboard thug. I don't have to go on here and mm, you don't know what you're talking about. No, 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 no. I called Pete Langman and got him on the program and asked him directly, dude, who are the people who does this? And back Pete Langman down. This dude, this troll online is posting books and bragging, doing exactly what I say white people do, bragging. I'm an expert. I'm an expert. Look at all the books on Peter Langman that I read. These are the same books I read. And again, I don't care what you read. I interviewed Peter Langman and we talked about this exactly more recently than when you read these books. Who does this? 
deal. Reb. Particularly, you start talking about a school shooting where it's not one person got shot. We had a beef. You stepped on my shoot. No, 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 no. A school shooting. We came to kill everybody. Mass shooting, they call them. Four more cat. Ain't no contest. White people are the only folks who do this. This week, to have this incident happen, and I think the same day, well, not because I don't even sit around and pay attention to all this. You know, I'll check every now and then, make sure I didn't miss a request if somebody's asking for a program or something constructive, that type of thing, as opposed to this sort deception really race soldier you can't be talking directly about this even in fact when I asked Peter Langman we got him on the program and I read that quote from Dr. Angeline Spalding Flowers who I communicated with just days ago she has a brand new book coming out the end of this year I read him that passage from her book the reason that we haven't made more progress we're not being honest the people who do these shootings are what it's not Tyrone it's Dill, Reb, white people. And we are not honest about that. Soon after he said that, bam, Georgia conviction, or excuse me, indictments for Colt 45. Where is Tyrone 45 that matter of fact? He posted lame reports of that case in Virginia. I said, no, 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 no. I need Tyrone 45. Tyrone and Jamal, we got our schematics, we got our pipe bombs, backpacks, all that. We going every guidance counselor, everybody, cafeteria workers, they all fixing to get it. Where is that case at? I know about Code 45. Double indictment. I said I hadn't seen this before. I guess the Crumbly's dud count. The cut, but I don't know that they do murder. I don't think they did the Crumbly's for murder. I have to go back to look at the charges specifically, but I mean. Why, if they had done this, we just heard from Mike Scholes, if they had done this 25 years ago, maybe we wouldn't be here. Prosecuted Reb, Eric Harris, Dill, Dylan Klebo, they had prosecuted their parents. Maybe white people would never, but not be buying no guns for these children. Matter of fact, did you hear that tacky exchange? They said... This little fella had a shrine to school shooters, the religion of white supremacy. I thought it was a shrine. I thought that's, you know, the language of some sort of religious or spiritual practice. You're talking about killing children. Specifically. <clears throat> white people do not care about children. He specified, I'm killing kids. I'm killing kids. He had a shrine to school shoot. I wanted to grab that troll race soldier online and say, buddy, how much do you want to bet it's not going to be one Tyrone Jamal Negra on this shrine? Let's put all the money down that you got. Every nickel food stamp I can find, how many niggers going to be on the shrine? When is the trial? Put the trial, put the shrine exhibit A. Who's on the shrine? And man, when Colin, 45, that's the dad, when he goes on trial, put that shrine up. Did you see this? Even put the mom on trial too for uh, uh, Macy Gray. Put her on trial, not the singer. Did you see this? I don't have no children. If my child had anything that looked like an altar, celebration, worship of Dylan Storm, or excuse me, Adam Lanza, Dill, Reb, any of these other little white shooters, like, whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. We're going to have to have all kinds. And that's going to have to come down. I mean, what is going on? You bought him up. This little fella, Colt 45, he went to his mother, Macy Gray. 
and says, uh, <clears throat> Moms, uh, I need to get me one of them uh, school shooter masks to finish up my outfit. Bill Rowe, uh, Code 45, what you need the school shooter mask for? Incidentally, I have no idea what is a school shooter mask. Did I, but what was, was that in Columbine? What is the school shooter mask? Come on. Anyway, she says, Mom, I need the school shooter mask. She says, Man, what, what you need the school shooter mask for? Call 45 and say, Oh, man, I'm going to shoot up the school. <laughs> I'm just loud. <laughs> my, my black brother, sick white brother, he says, Cap, 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 cap. His mom say, wait, wait, wait a minute, what, what you mean, what you mean, Cap, what that, what, what? It's, oh, that's, that's just the slang, see, it sound like you saying bang, bang, like you shooting me, da, 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 da. it just mean I'm, I'm, I'm just joking, I'm just, I, I, I'm not shooting up the school, I just, I just, anyway, you, you gonna give me the school shooter mask? Macy Gray need to be charged too. Believe, oh, see, I think them folks, Dill and Reb, I think they did. Anyway, we talked about all that. They should have been charged. I think they did the same thing. <laughs> Man, <laughs> what more What more do I need to tell you? I got the shrine up. I asked you for the mask. I told you I was, what more? What more? We went out shooting, got my AR-15. <sighs> Come on. And it's Colt 45. Can you find me? Let me see. Jamal 45. Can we find one of those? Hmm. Let's see. The vaping. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That segment on vaping. I hope everybody who called to that program back in 2013, non-white people purportedly, who, you know, insisted cannabis consumption is constructive. And I smoked cannabis as a teen, and I'm great. I was a great athlete. I was a great student. And I'm a great victim of racism now. And my brain is perfect. I hope all of you individuals heard that. Maybe go back and listen to it three times. And with the preface of Dr. Welsing, whew, you don't even know what's in this. Did they put the TCCA in the cannabis too? In the vapes too? We don't know. Now, anyway, they got to that segment on why do teens vape? Oh, my God. Man. Man. They went out and they got the little uh, 18-year-old. She went and started talking to folks. I wish they had video so that I could see what all these people look like. I didn't get that opportunity. This was audio. Whatever. They go out and start talking to people and say, oh, yeah, I remember we met at the party where you were out there vaping and, you know, doing all that. And you had and it looked so great. And I went and got some. Let me hit some of that. Okay, but man. Talk to your children about that specifically. Now, when you go to those parties, when you do the puff puff pass what does Dr. Welsing, the genius, what she say? You don't know what's in it. And it might be the person vaping, they don't know what's in this either. I don't think they had fentanyl 20 years ago when some of us were teeny boppers or wherever on the spectrum. But now that could be, oh, let me get ahead of that. Wow, that could be all kinds of problems, even if it's just, uh oh, now I got a new addiction. Now, things continued with this segment. They went and started talking to these young people. They at least had the sense, you know, don't use my real name. I might want to try and get a job one day or go to school. And, you know, <laughs> what kind of addictions I got right on with that. They start saying, well, you know, are you concerned about your health? Well, well you know, I might be. And, you know, I did pick up a strange, consistent cough I've had since I've been doing all this. But, you know, uh, YOLO. You only live once, right? 
I have heard lots of non-white people, I don't know if they were white or non-white, but I've heard lots of non-white people say that statement, YOLO, when it is something out of this world, non-constructed, like out of this world. You want to snort some crack cocaine? Eh, YOLO, let me try it. Sample of this fentanyl? Eh, YOLO, come on. <laughs> like, what? What? <laughs> It, so at 38, if you're addicted and find out that you got respiratory issues, lung cancer, all, is it still YOLO? If it is, yeah, I don't want to hear no weeping, crying. Oh, I don't know. I, I might not live to 40. And, ooh, I can't do that. But hey, it was YOLO, remember? I don't even know what that means. <laughs> like YOLO, so I should be as non-constructive and reckless as possible because you only live once. What does that mean? <laughs> what? I don't. Woof. It continued. They talked to the young fella. He said he was from Korea. I said, uh oh, we got a for sure non white person here, I think. Now he said, I am informed. I know this is not constructive, but everybody's doing it. Oh, I put my head down so bad. You are supposed to be a grown person. You are 18 years old. I don't want to hear nothing about no peer pressure. Like F, 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 F for parenting. I don't want to hear nothing about no peer pressure or because these days, like, oh, man, whole lots of people are doing all. Everybody was doing fentanyl at the club. So I, everybody was engaging in anti-sexual activity. So, you know, everybody was jumping into the Capitol. So, you know, come on, man. Come on, man. Now, I did have to pause because he did just say, I'm from Korea. You coming here, I want to fit in. I'm already Ashta. Ooh, look what he's eating. Ooh, and all the rest of it. Victim of white supremacy. Who is the everybody's doing it? Hmm. Anyway, so. And he says, they, do you know, he, he said he knew about the health problems and everything. And he said, well, since everybody's doing it, you know, we'll all have the same health problems. So it won't be that bad. We'll all be in it together. W-T-H. That almost sounds like I'm over here. I don't have that rattle. I don't have that cough. I got pink lungs and I feel bad because I'm they ostracize me I got my pink lungs and I'm breathing all right and they over there wheezing and coughing and I want to be down so I need to go wheeze and cough too let me get that vape man get some of that TCCA in my lungs and it continued I said what, what, what is what is it about all this and they talked to the fellow and he said man I got to have four five ten twelve of these around stop right there I don't Fuller said that Fuller said he said don't increase your needs don't give me nothing even if you're going to give it to me and I don't think they give these vapes away but I could be you know ignorant don't give me nothing even if it's grapefruits I'm going to be fiending man you got great I need me about 5 12 grapefruits a day man I can't even think if I ain't got no grapefruits whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> we're going to have to put these grapefruits down what in the world? You got to have 10, 20, what? You go through how many of these? Are, stop, stop, stop. How long is this supposed to last? Is this supposed to be indefinite, the next 10 years? The day he said, I tried everything. I got the gum. Again, you don't know what's in this. Further evidence of our ignorance, that young lady said, I commenced to puff puffing and vape vaping and oh, it was like the watermelons and the mangoes and the pineapples would just have an old jamboree in my mouth. You all will have to forgive me. I wanted to slap the taste out of her mouth. Oh my God. As someone, I have to pause and drink my smoothie. Mm, mm, mm. 
peach smoothie. Nonviolence, peach smoothie. No slapping. That is not watermelon. They don't even have no watermelon. They will put yellow number five, TCCA, formaldehyde, and high fructose corn syrup. And say, hey, if you heat it up just right, tastes like sherbet ice cream and watermelon. Like, come on, man. Matter of fact, have you had real watermelon, real mango, pineapple in a smoothie? Most many of the non-white people that I know, they have not. So they wouldn't even know what that tastes like to compare it to what you just puff, puff, puff. Oh, my God. Again, you don't know what's in these vapes and whatever else that they put it to be addicted to have you fiending. I got 15, 20 of these and twitching if I can't get and got this strange cough. I, that was easily the most disturbing thing that I have heard this month, right up high on the list. That Denoris Richardson, yeah, it would be top five easily. This is the next generation, man. And all of this, Julie Stan, when she was with us, the youth, youth, uh, youth sports and uh, the youth sports and the uh, youth brain, youth brain and youth sports, whatever it is with the title. But you, Julie Stamp, she was a guest on the program the beginning of 2023, right after DeMar Hamlin almost died. She had a long list as a neuroscientist. She had a long list of things not to do to protect your brain health. Tackle football was on the list. Alcohol consumption was on the list. Smoking, vaping, cannabis consumption was on the list. This is all for people, youth, that's what the book is called, all for folks that are under 25, brain computers still developing. You shouldn't be doing any of these activities to protect your brain computer. That and now anybody now, I want to hear that one again. So they say, hey, you vaping and smoking This compromises your brain health and development, which is not done yet at your age. Now, give me YOLO. Now, that's what I would expect because your brain is not developed. And this is supposed to be criminal activity, I thought, because these people are not 21. They said, you know, you're supposed to be selling it to them if they're not. That was another one. I said, think about now. Okay, now we make this legal and everybody thinks this is just wonderful and stupendous. Okay, now we got all these flavors as they said peanut butter crunch we talked about this before with the cannabis they got all these cookies and cream names and said, who is cookies and cream being marketed to I know you got some diabetics at 60 and 50 and they spent their whole life eating sugar but I bet a lot of that addiction to sugar probably started when they were children too any hoodles uh, last one I'll get into so many things happen the election and blah, blah, blah. Uh, we got privileged black male uh, Tyrone uh, Alpin out in Arizona. I would just say that is so super duper cowardly uh, to have a deaf black male with cerebral palsy. And you got to go as a group, jump and beat on them and all the rest of it. Like, it can't even be just a one of like, all right, I got the blind nigger. Me and you, one on one, I'll let you keep your stick. Admit now. Nah. No, no. Coward, that's Reb and Dill. Cowards all the way through. Cowards and racist. Uh, and I appreciate that they said in that report that it would be nice to think that this is training and they didn't know how to deal with someone who's disabled. But since they hopped on Tyrone immediately, it would seem this is beyond that. Yes, it would. Even, in fact, the newscaster referring to him on a first name basis, which I hate, you are not friends with Tyrone. Mr. Alpin, uh, I don't know what culturally deaf is either. They use that term. I'd never heard that before in my life, in my life. The last thing I'll, I'll say, and then we'll get to folks who dialed in. Here are the long segment on January 6th. That was CBC, Canadian News. They went and talked to the white, white woman who lied to her husband and all the rest of it about why she was there uh, for the January 6th white terrorism, uh, which might happen again depending on the results of the election. Uh, that was 
non-Clemson dad where he called in yesterday and said he spoke with some of his attempted family and was telling them that he had concerns there might be election violence again or that more of it I should say and I said I'll get out of here it's fake news fake news fake news I was like dang non-Clemson now he didn't graduate from Clemson that's like borderline heathen that's it I mean he's valedictorian I know he's a valedictorian I'm not even in the so-called family you have to know he's a valedictorian like dang do they just hand that out I mean does he have a reputation for just talking about nonsense and foolishness and fake news I mean dang (laughs) January 6th did happen that is just staggering now I mean he told us yesterday he said man you know I have to be careful talking about politics you know with family make minimize conflict and all the rest of it and we encourage the same thing but I mean wow once I remember hey he's valedictorian I'm not just some stupid you know regular Tyrone I'm valedictorian I went to school I know how to read I pay attention to the new like man what 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 that just further reminded me of the magnitude of the problem. Oh, it is so de- just in an environment. Everything from the vaping at 16 and that compromises your brain computer, your ability to think and reason. Everything just makes it so difficult to share constructive information and even in fact having a lot of non-white people who take these sort of opinions you don't know what you're talking about which is almost the default regardless if it's someone classified as black even if they're so called relative whatever you have to say if it's sounding like you're taking something political or something on racism something serious almost the default reflex response for a lot of non-white people is you don't know what you're talking about you don't know what you shut up you don't know what you're talking about (laughs) that's almost reflex It's even more stunning because a lot of us who take that perspective, we don't pay attention to the news. Man, like, uh, uh. it just, all of that just reminded me everything that's happened and, oh, man, we are in a very, very pitiful state. Do your best to be informed about what is happening in the world. And if you can share with others without causing conflict, great, but at minimum, inform yourself and try your best not to lie to yourself about things that are happening in the world as it relates to the global system of white supremacy racism. Number again, 605-313-5164, the code 564-943-POUND, press star 61 if you would like to participate have we had any other folks had, you know, difficulties talking to attempted relatives, parents, uncles about the election conflict? Or have, if we got success stories, right? When I say success in this small s success for sure, what I mean is we've been able to discuss the election, politics, what have you. No conflict. They shared their views. You shared your views wasn't necessarily I'm trying to change someone's opinion or get them to you know fall in line with my way of thinking but we discussed it we didn't have a beef maybe we learned something and we move forward that's what I'm saying success in this small isolated context if anyone's had that experience you can let us know or if you just mm-hmm, they went on you and Tyrone out there voting for Trump no 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 I'd count that as success too, because nobody got smacked in the mouth. No names called. Beautiful. 605-313-5164. The code 564-943-POUND. Press star 61 if you would like to participate. Let's see. Uh, Get to the switchboard and see if folks have commentary some of the news clips and or what's happening like I said with uh, the election local I guess or presidential uh, in your part hopefully we can get through all of this safely as soon as possible and get back to the business replacing white supremacy with justice immediately let's see 
some folks are give them a minute just to get their thoughts they have observations thoughts to share I don't know if they're spectating with all of the wackiness uh, happening all over the world uh, with the election I know some folks were talking about making what shall I say a code arrangements for the election if that means voting early voting by mail absentee ballot whatever it means not being in town perhaps <laughs> whatever it you know you deem safe man that might be you know something worth considering especially if you're in like a major city might be worth considering if you think you know they might and that's one where I would be paying attention also what's been happening locally I know in 2020 there were a number of cities they had been having violent outbursts all leading up to the election and then January 6th where people had been going to state offices and what have you and terrorizing election officials and what have you pay attention to the news in your local jurisdiction is that sort of stuff happening here have they been getting threats school been getting threats have they been talking about that on the local news that they you know might be fear of something happening here I would be mindful if it seems like you know it might be rowdy or what have you at minimum if you're by yourself, maybe I do all my shopping, you know, I got to go to the grocery store, what have you. You get up election day, what have you. You go to work. I am in. I'm not doing no gallivanting. I'm not running the streets. None of that. I'm going to be alert. What's going on? I'm not doing no major crowds. Or nothing. That's why I said get your shopping done. I'm not doing nowhere where it's crowds, anything like that. Get in and then make sure people are going to behave and be safe. If not, Hunker down. I would talk to your children. Oh, man. Where do you think you're going to be going? What are your plans for the day? Maybe stay in touch if things, you know, look like they might get unsafe. Home in me or you might go pick them up or, you know, whatever age appropriate. But I would check in with your offspring. If you have, you know, a care mate, what have you housemate, I would check in just, you know, you think anything might happen or what have you any concerns all of it just in case things get out of hand as we head into the culmination of all this like I said especially if you know you're in larger areas with larger cities or areas where they've been acting out already like in Arizona threatening election officials we talked about that yesterday I said man it's no way you could give me that job I gotta work at uh, one of the election offices and be telling people they don't have the right credentials to vote and all like oh my god Ugh. peace blessings and lots of prayers to all the people if you have any non-white people cows listeners you work any of those types of jobs Oof. May- maybe we'll pray for you and wish you the best maybe you can write down what your experience has been and what type of codification you've used to stay sane and safe during this process through the end of November. Maybe that we can do a request. Let's see folks who dialed in with commentary, uh, retired firefighter in Florida just mentioned. Did you have commentary? Greetings everyone. Uh, I uh, was just thinking uh, when you were running the uh, the reports about uh, marijuana uh, and uh, the uh, different uh, young people uh, describing their experiences. And uh, every time someone speaks about marijuana, uh, about its safe safeness, uh, that sort of thing, I I, I think about the almost 30 years that I spent uh, breathing smoke of different types, not knowing exactly what's in the smoke that I'm uh, consuming uh, in the, in the different fires that I've been in the middle of, or, well, of course you're going to have on a, a uh, mask when you're uh, in the fire itself, but, even before or during, if you're the driver, uh, you know, you're, you're not inside of the building, but the smoke is still there and uh, it's uh, available for your consumption to get into your system uh, in itself. And uh, 
So I'm thinking even just the smoke in itself would have to be something that uh, different uh, parts of your body, like your esophagus, uh, your lungs, uh, is going to be very challenging, let alone talking about in marijuana on what extra chemicals could be put into that content that because it has to be something in order for you to be willing to keep coming back to it. I mean, if it's nothing that attractive in it, then it wouldn't be as big of a deal as, as it's, 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 it is, you know, today. It's something, it's chemicals that lies in those objects that, that uh, uh, influences you deeply to come back again. Uh, you know, and uh, so that I, I think about that comparison all the time. Uh, no, I haven't uh, had any conflict uh, with uh, uh, the uh, election war, <laughs> uh, uh, primarily because that's how I plan it. Uh, and I do have a few conversations, but it's with people that I know uh, that I can have a conversation with, the same things that we talk about uh, or share on the cows. Uh, uh, I have conversations with others uh, who have the similar or same conversations, so I have an idea of who to, to converse with. I just figured that in due time, that person that I know otherwise would, uh, whatever, for whatever happens in the election, would find out for themselves about what they did, was it correct, was it the best thing they possibly could have done, that sort of thing. Uh, and then I may be available for questions that are asked, uh, or I may even ask a question in itself after the fact, uh, you know, and uh, that's basically what I uh, have to uh, report. And uh, thanks for listening. Much obliged, retired firefighter in Florida. That's what I say. Small S success. No conflict brawling with other non-white, <clears throat> excuse me, non-white people, attempted family members. In what you mean you vote Kamala Harris? What you mean you vote? None of that. None of that. None of that. He said, I already planned. <clears throat> this is not going to be conflict, brawl, none of that. None of that. They can say whatever, take whatever view, you know, or position that they want to take about the election, voting, not voting, whatever it is. But hey, we're not. This is not going to be conflict amongst non-white people. Super duper important. So much about the election is about generating conflict. And like I said, finding a way to blame black people is our fault. Blood sink Tyrone. He didn't want to vote. You know, that sort of thing. No conflict around the election. Now, the cannabis, like I said, I hope everybody who was with us, retired firefighter was one. He wasn't advocating. He was not advocating. I'm just saying he was present. But I hope everybody who was present and who was advocating, talking about all the joys and wonders of cannabis consumption, man, think about it or reconsider the addiction component is more like I said just just that alone that little fella and he's 18 brain is still growing maybe he's you know go to college could be the person to cure cancer who knows person to cure white supremacy racism who knows and he said I gotta have 5 10 12 and just boom all around go through one two it's like man what what is that people don't people don't behave that way about water you need water to live. What is in this even, man? People don't behave that way about food unless 
they slip something into that too. Now they do that sometimes with the coffee and other things. Well, oh man, the late, you can't eat just one. Sometimes can't even just eat one bag in a day. Got to have five, 10, 12 of them. Definitely, if you're going to have offspring, oh my gosh, you cannot be vaping, smoking. They have data about that in terms of the impact if the parents are consuming, uh, smoking, cannabis, all of that. Get that. I think that's in a uh, countdown where Shana Swan talked about that. If you're going to produce offspring, get that. Mm-mm. Let's go ahead and crack that habit. So I'm not smoking and vaping and cannabis consumption and all the rest of it. Like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not doing none of that. I'm not doing none of that. We're going to bring a child in. We're going to do. Hey, you, they got the chemical explosion in Atlanta. Food deserts. It's already difficult to get healthy. Anything. I'm not going to contribute to it. We don't have to smoke. We don't have to vape. We don't even have to do cannabis. If we're going to have offspring, let's at least we're going to be healthy, sober, make our best effort to see if we can have a healthy child. Reasonable, I think. Already already got TCCA in the air, so you're going to get a contact high of something. Let's try and see if we can promote clean oxygen. Get an air filter in the house. How about that? Any hoodles, uh, 605-313-5164, the code 564-943-POUND. Press star 61 if you would like to participate. Uh, give folks hmm, five minutes or so, see if they have additional uh, thoughts, observations to share uh, with the election, everything else that has been transpiring uh, with man, that segment in Missouri about the cemeteries, people that are in the Missouri area, man, I'd say maybe see if you could go if you're close enough to St. Louis, see if you go check it out that that right there in that report is exactly why I talk about <clears throat> study local history, study things that happen right where you are, especially if you are someplace where your family, you've been there for, you know, generations, like your grandparents lived in that region, parents lived in that region, aunties, other people. Oh, man. Study white supremacy racism in that region. It might be the exact same type of thing where you heard when they were talking to make sure I give out the uh, names, Shelley and uh, Raphael Morris in Missouri, where they were saying, man, I got great grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins and so many of these different relatives all of these folks are victims of racism the fact that the cemetery is in disrepair and they that usual suspects they come and dump trash and bags of whatever and all the rest of it all of that is white supremacy racism man we got to come and, and try and clean it up and get things back together and oh man grandma hattie was buried here and all the red like man study local history and it's been like I said it's been so many deliberate acts of this type of racism so that we are not we do not remember oh yeah the ancestors and you know my grandmother or grandpa even if they're great grandparents people that you didn't know they meant something to your parents they were a part of how you ended up in this position and you can study wow I wonder what sort of racism they experienced what did they do to try to compensate for all of that study local history that is in like I said that's when you can make it a family that's what they did that's what they did the Morrises they made it a family project we go out and clean man that is way now we could be on a Saturday now we sit around watch college football go hurricane see Michael Irvin act a fool every weekend or we go out we're gonna clean up the cemetery where I go out we get these uh, tombstones we set them up right get the garbage out get the rake clean it up get the trash take that to the dump all that like wow that even that's mr fuller's uses of time and energy cleaning and repair right there on the list and making it a family pride and then even uh, beyond what they said they were going and finding see if we can get the burial card so we can figure out oh okay this person was buried right here boom 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 go restore the records so then people come 
and they're looking and trying to find their relatives now yes you can come and bring some flowers you can come and clean it up and all that bring your children say hey this is your great great grandfather and your great great grandmother and white people tried to lynch him and you know all the rest of it like man that is and that is exactly what race soldiers do not want they want us totally disconnected and you don't know nothing you don't know nothing about your parents you don't know nothing about your grandparents you don't know nothing about you nothing just ignorant and then i could just come and lie and tell you anything that i want to lie about even who you are study local history can't say enough we have people in the cows listeners in the missouri area i think you should go like to the to the cemetery maybe see if you you know can help out if you have some free time and the the will the ability maybe you can pitch in contribute at least learn more about that facility to see do you have any relatives or anybody that's you know connected to the cemetery plot buried there anything else if you're you know missouri area or have any connection to that region any hoodles uh see see folks are still get spectating i reckon what have you bunkering down for hunkering down for uh the coming election all the rest of it holiday season and all that i don't even know i I would feel differently even about so-called holiday i don't do any of that stuff anyway but man with all the (laughs) chaos what shall i say potential violence with the election i would feel even some type of way about halloween partly because of what i just said I would feel some type of way of being in a large crowd like they've had, you know, the different shootings. And I think it was just last week in California. Certainly it was earlier this month. It wasn't that long ago. They had a big festival, uh, Coachella, and they arrested some fellow down there. They said he had firearms and all this and some sort of plot. He was going to carry out a shooting allegedly connected to the election and all this. I think Trump was in California at the time when the arrest was made. So given everything that has transpired, Man, I I personally would feel some type of way about being out at some sort of major event that's going to be a lot of people. If it's a political rally or a parade, any carnival, anything like that, I would feel some type of way about, you know, be, especially as we get closer to the election. I would not want to be there. Uh, and if I had children, I would feel some type of way about them. I, I wouldn't care if it's a birthday party or high school football game, anything like at, at minimum, if they were going to attend one of these functions. And when I say it's a large, like public gathering, I say large, I mean like, man, that number would fall now more than 20 people, maybe even less than that. But definitely if it's, you know, in the neighborhood of two dozen people, that's a large gathering. I would at minimum have some talks with them about who are you going to go to this event with? Where is this going to be? you've been paying attention we've already been talking about the news and stuff so you know what's been happening yes what's the plan you know you hear something what's the plan if a scuffle breaks out we've already i would go over all of that with your offspring so that they are not lost nothing like that they've already checked in and maybe even practice being at an event something happens you're a loud noise seems like it might be unsafe we're out of here immediately we're out of here get to a safe location make the call i'm there in five minutes to pick you up i would talk to your offspring and especially if they think you know they're going to some sort of rally or something like that like oh my god <laughs> like i i wouldn't even want them to be there i wouldn't even want them to be there like they've been acting white people have been acting such violent terrorists uh the whole time and then cult 45 gray and all the rest of it <sighs> we have to wait till 2025 and then we can go back outside Anyway, uh, other folks uh, who dialed in, let's see. Our caller in Florida, uh, Jeff Commentary, should be with us as well, sir. Yes, sir. May I be heard? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Greetings to Gus, the host, the listeners, and callers. Uh, I wanted to start out with the, the segment on um, Colt 45 gray, uh, where I heard that, that trend again with, uh, with white people where they, they like to say that someone's joking or something like that, or he's just playing around. Or, um, I, I noticed that gets used a lot 
when it comes to when they're practicing racism. And even when he was, was, I guess, I guess I can say showing the signs or just being honest maybe about what his intentions were or, you know, I I was just thinking of how uh, for he was, I guess, with the parents and it didn't seem like they, I guess, took it seriously. I just, I just thought that, you know, that, that phrase, what does it mean to be white and how, he didn't really face any consequences with those kinds of, or, or with that kind of an agenda, that kind of interest, having the shrine to all of these shooters. Um, and I agree to, I'm thinking all, all of the uh, shooters on that shrine, I'm thinking those are going to be um, other white people. Uh, the, the segment on the, I think that was the, the voter or the lady that, was trying to make it, I guess, seem like um, Trump was, I guess, being targeted or something and saying that the the news media, she can not trust uh, journalists or, or whatever the case may be. And uh, I think that was the same segment where the, the narrator or the person that was speaking on that, or, uh, on that audio segment was describing how she was, I guess being like fidgety or kind of moving around, like cringing, I guess. I guess it was cringeworthy um, when she was being shown the January 6th, that, that terrorism that happened that day. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I noticed that, that trend or that, that pattern where, hey, that's just 100% wrong. That's just 100% wrong. And I still hear them with the viewpoint that, I guess something, and then I noticed they use the word baseless. Maybe that's saying that they don't have any kind of evidence or anything, and they still was kind of like steadfast, you know, believing that that I guess something was taken from Trump or something that he won the election or he didn't lose. Um, and the, the the segment where the I guess that was two white people, um, the husband and wife, how that. I think that was deception where the wife was saying, oh, you're just mistaken. You know, I did say, <laughs> I, went, I guess she said she uh, told the husband that she uh, she went from, I guess, the speech from Trump to the bus. And then the guy was saying within the last few days or something like that, after all of these years, he found out that she actually walked with the crowd to the uh, Capitol and then she tried to make it seem like she wasn't lying. And, um, you know, I, I found that like kind of deceptive in my opinion. Um, but he, he noticed it. And if that was him as a, another white person, it just goes to show you how I think they, they know how they're practicing racism as well. And it sounded like she tried to, inject the metaphor where she says someone is born nine feet or, I mean, bare nine feet under, but he was making a point about how she wasn't, um, I guess, uh, forthright or honest with, with him about going to the Capitol and she turned it to something else. Uh, and it looked like he called that out as well. I found that interesting. Um, and other than that, uh, thanks for the uh, broadcast, and that's all I have to share. Thank you. Much obliged, uh, caller in Florida. I thought that was important as well when uh, the husband, the white husband, wife couple, when she I thought she lied to him as well about the whole capital and all of that uh and then he was talking to her about you know why did you and they're in North Carolina why you went down to the capital and I just found out about what you did and blah 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 
And she's saying, well, see, you got these people who mysteriously got nine feet up out of the ground and went and voted and stole the election. Scene. That's where she's like, wait a minute. Now, we, we're talking about two two different things. Like, that's, I don't know about the dead people voting, not the, but you you did go down to the Capitol and lie. <laughs> that's, two, that's two different, like, white people are so good at that. Like, they know, like, man, we got you on camera. You know, if she tried and minimize that, like, you know, it was people we went down. We were just patriots. Love. that. Was, oh. <laughs> That's enough. I could slap the taste out of anybody's mouth once they pop up. Love. On January 6th, like, get out of here. And then, oh, well, let's let's look at the loves. You, oh, no, I don't, I don't know if I want to see all the love. That's <laughs> so, wait a minute. Because with so much love, let's. Let's look at the love. She got all squirming and fidgeting. And, 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 ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Come on. Come on. And I was so glad to have that because they love to say that it was white men. And no, nah, man. No, nah, man. It was a whole lot of white women out there. Terrorism. Smacking folks up. The, you better run. She terrorizing another white woman. You better run. Get on out of here. I would real talk. I would have felt some type of way about even going to her house. Man, like I don't man. We have to meet someplace publicly. <laughs> we go, so let's go to let's go meet at the mall. Let's go meet at the Starbucks and we'll do it that way. I don't come and and her husband didn't divorce her after all this. Sound like they didn't just get married a couple of days ago. They've been together long enough. I suspect at this point, I know who I'm with. This isn't her first time cutting a fool. Illustration of what Fuller says when he talks about white people, racist. They will take both sides of an argument. There you go, right there. I'm a Democrat. I'm a Republican. I'm with Trump. I'm not with Trump. We voted for Obama the first. Whatever, <laughs> whatever. Wasn't that you hopping out of the Capitol building? You smacked a white woman. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Just long as, long as white people are in charge. Whatever, whatever, whatever. And like I said, hey, hey, all that even. You didn't lie to me and everything. Aren't we supposed to be truthful to the well? Yeah. Nah. nah. Even when it got to the end, and she's the person doing the interview. For CBC, that was in Canada. She said, well, now that we know what happened and everything, uh, you wouldn't do this again. She didn't just say, oh, my God, heavens no. That's not how she answered. She said, oh, my husband, he'll support me with everything. And then her husband got in and said, well, see, she didn't know last time. Now she knows and she wouldn't do that. Now, I would call that Fuller says that's you're helping the person with the answer. That could have been for a whole lot of reasons. Like, whoa, you sounded like you might go do it, but what is wrong with you? Or we still married. I want to protect the couple. Like, wait a minute now. She did it. Or maybe I want to make sure I pressure and let her know. Like, may man, you can't be going down there again. I don't approve of nothing. Like, maybe could have been lots of things. I do know she didn't just say no. No way. I've seen all that. People died and Ashley Babbitt. No, absolutely. That's not how she answers. She's, oh, man, my husband would support me regardless of what I want to do. Then once he interjected, she said, no, <laughs> man, I would not be surprised. I have to go back to get her full name. You live, think, depending on how things go this time around. Lo and behold, she then ended up down there again. Ugh, white women do it better. Incidentally, when they had the uh, segment, they ended where they were talking about Kamala Harris and she said she was going to focus on issues for black dudes. I don't know if that persuaded any of you all. If it did, whoopee. Uh, where she said, what's it, cannabis entrepreneurial opportunities? <sighs> 
have to be offended anew each week like it was you know you blame no count Tyrone and the rest of you black males are so stupid and ignorant and misogynist that you won't even vote for Kamala Harris like what <laughs> Wait a minute. what and they come around and like okay we're gonna look out for you we're gonna get cannabis shops don't you want to camp like what I'm offended anew like what she said she was gonna look at you know medical problems that specifically afflict the negro male like Tyrone Alpin Eh. Eh. we'll see Uh, I will be glad when the election is oh if we can get through it safely and if it's like last time and we get through the election only have it drag on and be contested and terrorism on the front steps of the White House and elsewhere then you know well it doesn't really matter because that does not bring about a resolution to all of this but I'll be glad when it's done and we can just get back to the business of replacing white supremacy with justice immediately uh, should be here I think Tuesday when that black fella I forgot when the black fella on the segment talking about Kamala Harris's economic plan when he said hey we got all these immigrants coming over here and taking resources all the rest of it popular talking point I've heard that a while the the greatest moochers in the known universe Elon Musk Tesla is really subsidized probably Space Station X too Brett Favre looting the welfare rolls in Mississippi TANF Jim Jones he took all the social security supplementary security checks social security checks all the rest of it the greatest moochers welfare cheats in the known universe easily are all classified as white Pedro anybody else coming here so called illegally Tyrone ain't got nothing on Elon Musk Brett for how many Pedros you heard they got to loot the whole TANF program they didn't get five dollars ten they got a volleyball court facts anywho Tuesday we'll be here uh, much obliged folks tuning in hopefully worthy of your Saturday evening stay safe I'd be mindful if you're out at you know public events and such it is dangerous volatile sobriety would be best contrary to the YOLO ethos of life in the system of white supremacy racism there are so many poisons chemical biological what is TCCA rampant in Atlanta right now whole city Atlanta Falcons ready for the game tomorrow smelling like chlorine given that that is our environment global cesspool isn't that what Dr. Canvon says we can do our best hey I'm going to take care of myself I'm not going to put any extra poisons in my body certainly if you have children I am going to set a brilliant and constructive and healthful example for my offspring they are not ever going to see me puff puff give drink of this beer shot of that none of that none of that none of that sober creator we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people victims of white supremacy we ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times in all places each and every time we are in contact with another black person it has been time replace white supremacy with justice immediately no name calling black people even about the election no gossiping no throwaway offspring cows signing out
Thanks all for tuning in. Nigga, you so brainwashed. I'm a victim, What's brother. Problem? You're a victim. Man, I'm a victim. I'm a victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm -hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned. <laughs>